This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after ten is the time. I don't, you know, have you ever cared enough about anything to take to the streets to protest? Seems like an odd question, doesn't it? Because so much of our de- democracy depends, at least, on the principle of the freedom to protest. And while a lot of us have perhaps been looking the other way, politicians like Priti Patel and, and, and Suella Braverman, and to a lesser extent now James Cleverly, seem to be at least um, uh, flirting with the idea of taking away some of our most fundamental rights and freedoms, oddly, in order to curry favour with the kind of voter who insists that they really treasure our freedoms and values. It's a, it's a funny old business. But have you ever felt strongly enough? You see, it covers a very broad gamut of people doesn't it you may have only ever taken to the streets of this country or this city i I broadcast to you from london most days uh, to resist the new labor movement's determination to abolish fox hunting that was one of the biggest protests that we've seen it may have been student fees and you look back upon your idealistic callow youth and you can't quite believe you got involved in that sort of behavior i mean you weren't swinging from the cenotaph or anything like that but you were certainly uh, caught up in the mood of the moment i think statistically the numbers that registered highest were the ones that wanted Tony Blair not to join George W. Bush's assault upon Iraq, the second Gulf War. I think statistically they must be the ones that you were most likely to have gone on. Um, I went on one of those. I went on one of those in Glasgow, although not with my full chest, actually. I just happened to be in love with somebody who was determined to attend. But the point being, of course, that the numbers were extraordinary. The poll tax, if you're of a certain age, saw protests cross over into violence. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot, isn't there? There's a lot of opportunity. There are a lot of examples of things that you may have felt were... Matters so urgent, issues so egregious, that you would exercise in many ways the only right you have to tell the people in power what you think. And it's a right that becomes ever more precious according to how deaf the people in power are to your voices or how much control the people... That's not quite correct. How much... um, Uh, crossover, intersection there is between the people in power, the government, and the sources that we rely on for our information. And sometimes the the, the disconnect between the public and the power, the, the disconnect between public and power can seem extraordinary. And and I think we're in that position now. There's two articles that I would urge you to read, both of which you can read for free, although the second one uh, would involve you signing up to the New York Times and and, um, availing yourself of the opportunity to read a couple of articles for nothing. It's an opinion piece by Thomas L. Friedman, and it appears under the headline, Israel is losing its greatest asset, acceptance. I'll just read you the opening lines. I've spent the past few days traveling from New Delhi to Dubai and Amman, and I have an urgent message to deliver to President Biden and the Israeli people. I am seeing the increasingly rapid erosion of Israel's standing among friendly nations, a level of acceptance and legitimacy that was painstakingly built up over decades. This columnist, who I don't think I've come across before, articulating something that I have tried to articulate to you myself. Those of us who desperately want uh, Israel to retain the support and the standing that it currently enjoys among friendly nations, or certainly that it enjoyed quite rightly among friendly nations and friendly people when that terrorist atrocity commenced on October the 7th, are worried that the continuing actions of Benjamin Netanyahu's government are alienating precisely the people um, who can agitate and articulate in favor of the Israeli position. That, that would be the first article that I would direct you to today. The, the second would be a piece in The Guardian, which of course you can read for nothing, by the rather brilliant journalist Raphael Baer, who I think is Jewish. Um, I, I, certainly if I've read it correctly, that's, well, I, I mean, he is. Um, and he makes the point 
the the conflation, if you like, the the um, uh, the symmetry, the exhausting symmetry, the grim symmetry with Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, in many ways lets everybody down. It's it, it doesn't use the word, but it speaks to the theory of footballification. It's essentially saying that we're allowing Islamophobia to become a conservative party problem and anti-Semitism to be a Labour Party problem, which not only makes a mockery of many of the facts, but also profoundly lets down the victims of both bigotries. Uh, you know, the idea, he d describes it as a grim, exhausting symmetry um, and uh, it brilliantly articulates something which, again, I've tried to uh, explain to you myself this week and, and in previous weeks about how it, it is being used opportunistically by people who actually, by dint of the way they're built, they could easily go the other way. If the wind changed, certainly a lot of the people on the right of British politics claiming to be exercised by anti-Semitism would be very comfortably anti-Semitic if they felt that that was more used to their political ambitions or their media uh, projections. And many people on the left who claim to be profoundly anti-racist somehow have an enormous blind spot when it comes to anti-Semitism. And, and it does none of us any favours, least of all victims of anti-Semitism and indeed Islamophobia. So I just want to put that backdrop in place before I tell you what the current Home Secretary, and I, 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 you can be forgiven for not being able to keep up with who's in that job. So uh, Suella Braverman has been sacked again, if you've been um, nodding off a bit or on holiday. Suella Braverman now has been sacked by the last two Conservative Prime Ministers, but she remains a very well-known author of legal textbook. Oh, no, I beg your pardon. That was something that she claimed she'd done when it turned out all she'd done was a little bit of photocopying for the actual author. So... He, James Cleverly, the king of nominative determinism, has told Palestinian protesters to stop protesting regularly. And I am going to ask you what you think of that. Because my initial reaction to it is one of, uh, uh, well, it's a form of fear. If I talk about previous protests, I'm not necessarily suggesting that the cause of pro-Palestinian protesters is of equal value or equal salience to the other causes. But I'm imagining suffragettes, well, suffragists, of course, um, protesting. Suffragettes went rather further. And they were essentially victims of politicians trying to take their right, right of protest away. Freedom of assembly as much as freedom of expression, are absolutely crucial to the public's ability to hold power to account. You have, uh, I suppose, apartheid in South Africa as something which the powerful in this country supported and were comfortable with. Most obviously, I think, Margaret Thatcher and her ilk. And yet the importance of protesting against that, whether through marches or, or boycotts or otherwise was I think in retrospect pretty close to sacrosanct I said yeah, there will be other things pick your favorite that's why I opened the show in the way that I did you go oh, you've made your point now no more protests about fox hunting please you've made your point now no more protests against war please you've made your point now no more protests against women not having the vote please you've made your point now no more protests against segregation on public transport in America no more protests against uh, de facto color bars in various um, employments in even this country you can't drive a bus if you're black but please stop protesting about it no 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 you, you've made your point so that's the principle that james cleverly is taking aim at today he says and i quote i think the organizers should recognize that they've made their point they've made it loudly and they're not adding to it by repeating themselves i'm not sure i could disagree with that more strongly but i don't want to confine this conversation to people on the same side of it as me because somewhere beyond the principle lie the practicalities and the practicalities of it are 
increasing costs to the Metropolitan Police, currently under, we are told, their greatest period of sustained pressure since the London Olympics in 2012. We know that the scenes on Saturday on Tower Bridge were unacceptable. Um, Vehicles and pedestrians unable to use that thoroughfare after demonstrators lit flares as they demanded a ceasefire in Gaza. Not to make light of it, but some dopes lit flares at Kidderminster Harriers game against Solihull Moors last night and uh, they're unlikely to have their collars felt any more than the people who did it on Tower Bridge so again don't get carried away with the characterization of the protests Uh, generally the behaviors in which uh, we get caught up and irritated by would be relatively commonplace in other contexts they really did throw a flare onto the pitch at Solihull last night but it didn't stop um, Phil Brown's red and white army from securing a valuable and possibly season changing 1-0 victory over our local rivals I digress slightly the the, 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 the central question in a way is about the significance of um a Home Secretary telling you that you're not really you're not really allowed to protest anymore. You should stop protesting. I, I want your immediate response to that on 03456060973. James Cleverly, um, it, it has been suggested already in a couple of texts. C- could he not just tell Israel that they've made their point too? With I think now in excess of thirty thousand people dead. I, I equally could you not just tell Hamas that they've made their point too? They're no more likely to stop their murderous ambitions than Israel is to stop its continuing attack upon Palestinian people in Gaza. And if you prefer semantics uh, uh, to uh, principles, uh, you could say their continuing attack on Hamas in Gaza, which unfortunately involves the killing of tens of thousands of innocent civilians and uh, rendering, I think, 17,000 children orphans or at least unaccompanied in in the current context. I don't know if you'd describe it as collateral damage, but... Certainly, some people are prepared to accommodate that morally in order to pursue the greater goal, um, which sometimes is the eradication of Hamas, sometimes it's the release of the hostages, and sometimes it's, it's, it's neither, and sometimes it's both. It, but it is a greater goal. So, quarter past ten is the time. What would you say to James Cleverly when he tells you, as someone who goes on these marches, you've made your point now, Please stop. All right. That, that's what I want to hear. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. Uh, newspapers are queuing up to condemn protesters. Very hard to find anywhere in the media that properly reflects the public opinion refle- uh, described in opinion polls. And J- James Cleverly, as the killing continues, is somehow in a place where he thinks telling the people calling for the killing to stop have made their point. Surely the point is only made when it's stopped. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't. I haven't marched. I'm tempted to go along. There's one a week on Saturday. I'm tempted to go along simply to see whether or not the pictures you have painted for me about what's actually going on at these marches is more accurate than the one being painted by people like Suella Braverman and 30p Lee Anderson. All right? So... How serious is it when a Home Secretary tells peaceful protesters to stop marching and you can make the point, well, you know, it's they've been let down by the ones that aren't peaceful, but that would apply to pretty much any protest ever. And the second question is, what would you personally say to James Cleverly when he tells you, as a pro-Palestinian protester, that you've made your point now and it's time to stay at home? Have a have a think about that. Uh, you don't even have to have been on the marches, of course. You could just be sympathetic to the general cause of wanting to see an end to the killing in Gaza and the release of the hostages, of course. 0345 6060 973. The actual Home Secretary is telling peaceful protesters to stop because they have made their point. I want your thoughts on that. And, of course, you come at it from agreeing with him as well. I'd, I'd, I'd really welcome that, actually. You need to be a little bit sensible. Don't ring in to complain about the fact that we're talking about something different from the thing that you wish we were talking about. That rarely goes well. But do give me a call and tell me why you think James Cleverly is right. In fact, I know I'm a little late for the break, but I'll just take a moment to stress that point still further. I want Because there is a clash between principle and practicality. 
You know, you cannot have London subject to a mass protest every single day. London cannot be brought to a standstill every single day. You, you know, I think the last time things were really, really brought to um, an absolute standstill were the um, probably the Queen's funeral. I mean, imagine if something of that scale was unfold. We would literally never get anything done. And therefore, you may have a strong case logistically, practically, whatever it may be, for saying, actually, do you know what? James Cleverly is right. We've marched a dozen times. Uh, everybody knows we're there. Everybody knows what we want. Nothing's really changed. Therefore, I'm going to accept James Cleverly's advice and stop protesting because, in his own words, we're not really saying anything new. Please stop killing people. Yes, you said that last week. You're not really saying anything new. I think you can stop now. You can stop calling for the killings to end because... Mm, you're not really saying anything new. Go on, have a crack. 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 22 minutes after 10 is the time. Do we stop fighting, asks John, for freedom and democracy? Do the right wing ever stop campaigning for tax cuts that benefit only them? I think it was Chomsky who said that if you believe something is wrong, you should protest it every day. And that's from Hartlepool. Well, I mean, I, I don't know that Chomsky would necessarily agree that he protested every day to the point of bringing huge swathes of a city to a standstill. But every month, every week, every weekend. The next one is scheduled for a week on Saturday, which is beyond the six days currently necessary for organisers to give notice. Um, and unfortunately for Cleverly, one of the suggestions he makes is that perhaps it should be beyond six days that you have to give notice. So when the Home Secretary tells the British public to stop protesting because they've made their point, but the thing they're protesting against continues, what does that say to you? And what does it say about all of us? Tariq is in Rotherham. Tariq, what would you like to say? Morning, James. How are you? Very well, mate. What's on your mind? Oh, I can't disagree with uh, with uh, James Cleverly more. Um, the idea that one is ex that you should be expected to stop peacefully protesting when you're not feeling as though those who you are trying to talk to haven't got the message. It's, it's just it's just absolute nonsense. You've got to keep going. What, what if you can't guarantee that the protest will be peaceful? Well, all you can do is guarantee what you and yourself can do. Yes. So I well, can't, well, the, I the, can't the, tell. The, the onus on the organisers and, and actually the political response is more complicated than that, isn't it? That's fair enough. And yeah. I also think that you've got to listen to the rhetoric of the organisers. And Britain has been quite clear and very, very harsh when they believe that there are organisers who are speaking about the wrong message, that they immediately step in and either call them um, all kinds of names, arrest them, uh, give them warnings or don't agree to their protest. I don't know that I've I seen any evidence of, of, of people being charged who haven't behaved in, a, in an abominable fashion, personally. I agree, right. I agree, because I don't think there has been any... There's been a few. ...organisers. Well, uh, there are no organisers that I'm aware I of. I beg your pardon, I'm yeah. talking about people on the march, not the people who've organised it. You, again, you can't control what everybody on the march does as an organiser. You can only put out your message, make it peaceful, make it reasonable. We're doing this, we're going down this street, we are following the rules. You mm. can't say X and Y and Z. You've got to... Uh, you've got to make an individual citizen responsible for what that individual citizen says. And if somebody says something that's out of bounds, they've absolutely got to take responsibility themselves. If the organisers have suggested that people can say things that are out of bounds, the organisers and then the entire protest can then be marked with that, but only if the organisers are actually... Um, and, and what about the philosophical point of pointlessness, if that's not uh, a, a conundrum in and of itself? I, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the idea that a Home Secretary, what he's really saying between the lines is, listen, Tarek, it doesn't matter how many bloody weekends you spend marching, we're not going to change our policy ever, so just stay at home and watch the football. That's not how it works here. I would, no. I would say that immediately. That's not how it works here. We have a vote every few years where we get to tell our lead what kind of leader we want in. But that doesn't mean that we then take our hands off and let it happen after that. We are a society that has decided that we can talk about things, that we can actually have a view on things. And that, that reasonable people, we recognize that reasonable people can have completely opposite views on the very same subject. And, and the idea that that 
you as a Home Secretary start getting pissy, and forgive me if I can't say that on the radio. Well, you have now, but don't say it again. <laughs> okay. Start getting annoyed when people start to uh, do things regularly. That starts costing money. Hey, look, that's part of the deal of having the freedoms that we have. We've agreed as a society that protests are okay. You put rules in, they follow the rules. Then we have to pay for the police to, to protect them. That is part of the deal, James. That is, and and, that and is we all pay all for every work. protest. I, I, you know, that's why I began with the list of things that hardly... I'd be amazed if anybody listening was in favour of all of those protests, against the poll tax, in favour of uh, fox hunting, against the uh, continuing attacks upon Gaza. Uh, what, what else did we have? I mean, the idea of someone who'd have been on all of those marches, the, the, the student fees, it'd be remarkable. Thank you, Tarek. It's a, it's a nice start, and I'm grateful for it. The one protest march I forgot to mention, bizarrely, is, is the only one that I've both been on and spoken at, which was, of course, that desperate and ultimately doomed attempt by some of us to um, stop the madness of Brexit before... It actually happened. I, I think in retrospect, people probably needed to taste the, the, the poison before they recognised how toxic it was. But hey, we, we did our best and I even gave a speech at that one. So again, that, that list of things which have been subjects of public protest, Black Lives Matter. And then, of course, one weekend uh, at around the same time, uh, there was a march for racists, essentially, people who were against the idea that black lives should matter as much as white lives. So they, they got to march as well. There's not going to be anybody who's been in favour of every march that ever happened. So is 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 Cleverly's point simply quantity? It's got, well, there's so many of these blooming marches. But surely that's the point at which a politician goes, crikey, maybe maybe we should be listening more. Chris is in Alton in Hampshire. Chris, what would you like to say? Well, on the philosophical point, yes. um, telling people to stop marching because they've made their point, I, I, I would make an analogy with telling somebody who's in pain to stop saying ouch. Yeah. Um, uh, if you're still in pain then you go on saying ouch. Um, and uh, I would encourage you to, to, to go to one of the marches because the media description of what's going on um, uh, ac across the board, really, is complete nonsense. Um, I mean, th I think the last one, there were no arrests at all. Um, and for a crowd of several hundred thousand to have no arrests at all... I, I don't know I mean, that it's that big, is it? <clears throat> oh, it was. It was certainly, um, uh, certainly uh, uh, over a hundred thousand. There them. must have been arrests at Tower Bridge on Saturday. Although uh, yeah, you, you will possibly, then tell me that's not uh, one of the properly that, organised that wasn't marches. One of the, yeah. Wasn't one of the one of the. So that's the things you can't control as Home Secretary. Anyway, these sort of impromptu well, protests. But uh, but you can't you, you can't you know it's like wildcat strikes. There's nothing you can do about those. It doesn't matter what legislation you have. Um, people may break the law, but um, uh, but the. You know, all this stuff about it's not safe for Jewish people to walk streets. I mean, there are Jewish people on the marches, thousands of them. Yeah, but if you're um, holding up a placard saying stop the killing, um, while also uh, visibly uh, uh, Jewish, uh, and that would normally mean quite orthodox, wouldn't it, by way of, 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 of dress and, uh, and, and, and appearance, that, that's not quite the same as saying that all Jewish people would be safe. I don't know how... I don't know how the opposite would, would happen. I don't know how somebody who wasn't... Well, uh, and, but I think the, the idea that there, there is a, um, you know, there's a sort of majority of people on the marches who are, um, uh, who are antagonistic to Jewish people is just nonsense. Yes. The, 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 the people on the marches but, but this is, this are is, this antagonistic is, to injustice. Yes, they are. But there are, there are people on the marches who are antagonistic to Jewish people. And as we discovered in the recent years of British politics, quite often they don't realise that they are antagonistic to Jewish people. And that, that is intimidating for Jewish people, that, that thought that there are people there who, who conflate and who, con who conflate and then condemn. Oh, I think the line dropped off. Uh, half past ten is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. You are living in a country where the Home Secretary, who has overall responsibility for policing and therefore for protests, thinks that people marching in support of Palestinians, people calling for a ceasefire, um, should just stop now because they've made their point. And the more I say that out loud... The more I fall into that trap, I occasionally fall into of thinking they can't be quite as crass as they appear to be. Can they? Surely there's something going on in Cle Cle James Cleverley's mind that is currently eluding us. Because if there isn't, this is an intervention of really quite extraordinary silliness. Uh, it is Wednesday, remember. And last week at PMQs, 
Keir Starmer uh, I, I reminded some of us of how he sounded when he was quizzing Boris Johnson about the parties at Downing Street. He sounded very loyally. Last week, Rishi Sunak failed to support Kemi Badenoch's suggestions that the former, the sacked chairman of the post office, uh, was being investigated for uh, his behaviour. That story took an absolutely extraordinary turn at Select Committee yesterday. And I think it's made PMQs today an appointment to listen. Although Keir Starmer does have a habit when you think that you know exactly where he's going to go at 12 o'clock on a Wednesday, he does have a habit of going somewhere completely different. But that's another reason to listen as well. But before all of that, Thomas Watts is here with your headlights. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.35 is the time. Um, I don't really know what it is you care about, but if, you, if you've protested about it a few times, it's time to stop. You've made your point. Stay at home. I think that's the message coming from the Home Secretary. I am short of people supporting it because you'd have to support it applying in all cases. You can't just support it in this case. I wish those people would stop protesting about the killing of all the people in Palestine. It's, it's making other people look bad, which is the point of Thomas Friedman's article in the New York Times today, which I heartily recommend. But from, a, from an objective point of view, and that's why I recommend Raphael Baer's piece in The Guardian today. It's a supremely objective point of view. If you, if you are approaching this story objectively, and uh, albeit that the stakes currently are much higher on one stroke, quote, side than they are on the other, the damage that Israel is doing to its international standing and its, and its international support is immense. And, and therefore, really, to attack those of us being objective for being biased actually makes that situation worse. It accelerates, perhaps, that process of, of, of disillusion. Not for me, don't worry. I've been doing this for long enough to know exactly where the path of, of righteousness lies and where it leads. But for other people, if you simply say, I wish they'd stop killing Palestinian civilians and you call them anti-Semitic or pro-Islamist, then chances are you're going to be chasing people into the enemy camp or at least into the opposition camp when they were susceptible to um, either staying in the middle or even edging a little bit closer to you. So you've made your point. A lot of you are wondering whether James Cleverly is minded to apply that to elections. Um, you've made your point that you may as well not ever vote again. Does Cleverly, asks Clive, who travelled from North Wales to that march I spoke at. He says, does Cleverly want elections to stop? We've had an election. The point's been made. Move on. I think that's probably what Hamas would say in the Gaza Strip. The only thing that justifies their uh, retention of power is an election that happened long, long, long ago. And Donald Trump is already making noises in America to the tune of if he wins this one, there may not be any more ever again. I don't think James Cleverley's in, in, in either of those camps. I don't think he's politically akin to either Hamas or Donald Trump. But you never know if he thinks public protest has a sort of time limit on it, then maybe votes do too. Naz is in Enfield. Naz, what would you like to say? I'd like to say that we've fought for a long time for the right to protest. And I've been on the march and it's very peaceful. And I walk with all people from all walks of life, all races, all religions. And um, to take that away from us, the Conservatives um, are supposed to be anti-state control, but they're trying to control their people. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, one of the great anomalies of, of, of the small state mythology, the vampiric mythology of small state government, is that you'd need a hell of a lot of authorities and, uh, and, and uh, law enforcement officers to stop the massive majority of the people from protesting against the injustices and inequalities that a small state vampiric government would bring in, Naz. But let's not, let's not complicate their little brains with these observations. You, you, you have been, so you know more about it than people who haven't, myself included, how easy would it be to find trouble at one of these marches if I went looking for it? Very difficult. Are you I'm a sure? Muslim my yes. I'm a, I'm a Muslim myself. I've been talking to people who've come from Spain, you know, not Muslim, to people, Jewish people, and, and everybody is peaceful. They're nice to each other. I mean, it's... I'm, I'm proud to be a Londoner when I'm there. Sometimes when I'm not there, I feel a bit 
you know, oh dear, anti-Muslim hate's gone up, and I and I've been a victim of anti-Muslim hate. Right. But but um, there it is it it is just people in. Um, you know, smiling, laughing at each other. You get old ladies from um, from the north coming down. You get. Well, we had we had our friend in in Lancaster earlier this week who works on a supermarket checkout in Lancaster, and she's been she's been on on marches as well. I don't want. I mean, listen, I can only work with the calls that I get, but I I, I don't want to gloss over some of the obnoxiousness that we have seen, some of the criminality that has unfolded on these marches. And I think, Naz, there must come a point where, albeit that it's a minority spoiling it for everybody else, they can't be allowed to continue. And the only way of stopping it is to stop it for everybody else. That's not actually the point that Cleverly is making. There is, whether he realises it or not, a tacit admission in Cleverly's call upon people like you to simply stop protesting because you've made your point that the description of these protests has probably not been entirely accurate because if it was, the Home Secretary would be able to act in a much more draconian fashion. He's kind of admitting that he can't, really. It's not a law-breaking issue. I just wish they'd stop because I don't really like what I'm hearing them say. Yes, yes, it, it, it seems to stir again against Muslims, against, you know, the hate marches that Suella Braverman was suggesting. It seems to play into that, albeit more gently, but it seems to be playing into that. Do we, do we know if she's of, been on anywhere near one? I, I, I very much doubt it. She went on the hostage, anti-hostage march. That's fine. That's and, good. And her, her, yeah, yeah, no, it's very good, but her... Her, I think she's an Islamophobe. I mean, I know you're not supposed to, that, that word doesn't exist or whatever, but but all this, and James Cleverly to play into that, you know, it, it just doesn't seem right to stop people protesting. It, it, Especially it against something feel... so big. I, I, I think yeah. that's a word you can use without fear or favour, actually. Against something so big. I, I mean, the, the relationship between the death toll and the time that has passed is absolutely stunning. The, 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 the descriptions of the amount of ordnance used on that tiny strip of land in comparison with other previous conflicts is absolutely stunning. The howl of protest that these marches represent or, or this, this plea to be heard um, is built in large part upon horror and heartbreak and to tell people to stop being horrified and heartbroken or at least to stop articulating their horror and heartbreak seems to me to be unfair i mean no one would have dreamt in a million years of calling upon uh, the, the march that suella braverman did go on if people were to organize a march like that every weekend and enough people were to attend to make it a, a, an issue of public order, that, that, i.e. the police need to be involved and i can't quite imagine what the reaction would be if, from from most newspapers in this country, if James Cleverly were to suggest, if you're marching for the release of the hostages, you've made your point, you're not going to change anything, Hamas aren't going to listen to you, you might as well stay at home. And this is why I found Raphael Baer's article in, in the Guardian newspaper today so powerful, because he manages to be truly objective, to be truly clear-eyed, and to talk about the grim symmetry between Islamophobia and the danger which we have articulated many, many times on this programme of letting it become a footballification issue. So, you know, uh, uh, if you're right-wing, you're Islamophobic. If you're left-wing, you're, you're anti-Semitic. And the other side will use these accusations to bite chunks out of each other when neither really display much concern or feeling for the, for the true victims of the kind of behaviours and hatreds that Naz has just described, even when they're being articulated by people like Suella Braverman, who I think is the reason why conservative politicians can't call Lee Anderson Islamophobic or indeed racist. They simply can't. This popped up at about 40 minutes into yesterday's programme. Thanks to you, not me. I didn't spot it. Why can't these people? Why are they embarrassing themselves routinely? On my list already, I've got Oliver Dowd and Mark Harmer, Rishi Sunak, Michael, Mark Harper, Rishi Sunak, Michael Tomlinson and Chris Philp. And that's in six days. So that's pretty much one a day, the ministers that are sent out to do the interview round. And so what did Lee Anderson do wrong? Oh, he, he, he did something wrong. What did he do wrong? Something wrong. Yeah, but what did he do wrong? Something wrong, James. Yes, but what did he do wrong? He did a wrong thing, James. He did a wrong thing. A wrongy wrong thing. Wrongy wrongy wrong. Please ma make this interview end soon. It was, yes, but what did he do wrong? 
the thing he did wrong, James, is the thing he did wrong. I mean, you think I'm exaggerating. That's basically the conversation that Nick Ferrari had with Michael Tomlinson yesterday. Chris Philp, arguably, arguably, has made an even bigger marshmallow of himself this morning with Kay Burley on Sky News. I may treat you to a few of those clips, actually, after this. In fact, I will. We've, uh, we've put together a selection of Conservative MPs humiliating themselves on 30p Lee's behalf. And as Naz has just alluded to, they're not doing it out of loyalty to 30p Lee. Some of them probably agree with his big bigoted bile, or indeed his bilious bigotry. But they can't say that out loud. The reason why they can't properly criticise or condemn what he's done is because the minute they do so... Any interviewer with an IQ in double figures will respond by saying, but how is that different from what Suella Braverman's done? How is that different from what many Tories have done over the last few years? If, 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 that's, a, if that's a sackable offence, if you lose the whip for doing that, for saying that Sadiq Khan is controlled by Islamists, why don't you lose the whip for saying the whole country is or, or that Keir Starmer is in hock to them? So... The inability of senior Conservative MPs to tell the truth about what Lee Anderson has done is built upon, I think, the irrefutable and unavoidable premise that Suella Braverman's done even worse. And I'll prove it to you after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 10 minutes to 11. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. It's been in the news a lot. Uh, possibly not in circumstances that he welcomes. Well, clearly not in circumstances that he welcomes, but he'll be here tomorrow taking your calls on LBC. You know who it is now, because I really do it with one politician, but um, uh, maybe a few more will start popping in to say hello as the as the election nears. But if you would like to put a question to the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, victim of the vile slurs from Lee Anderson that most Tory MPs are unable to describe as vile slurs, then uh, you can get your question in ahead of time by heading over to lbc.co.uk forward slash question. Do you, do you still say forward slash or do you just say slash? You say, for, you say forward slash. Thank you. Don't call me granddad. Otherwise, give us a call tomorrow from 10 on 03456060973. And amazing technology means that you can now WhatsApp the studio using exactly the same number 03456060973 um all right i'll do it all in one so here is oliver dowd and mark harper rishi sunak michael tomlinson and chris philp showing what happens when you can't call one of your colleagues one of your sacked colleagues a racist or an islamophobe because if you did you'd open the door to the admission that loads of your other colleagues are as well especially suella braverman is it your view that saying, I believe they've got control of Cannes and they've got control of London, is that Islamophobia? Well, I think the, the, the chance that it could be taken, the, the fact that it could be taken in that way is the reason why uh, those comments uh, led to the Chief Whip asking for an apology from the, the, the Prime Minister. I share those uh, concerns about how they could be taken in that way, and that's why it was right he should be asked for an apology, and when he failed to give that apology, the, the whip was removed. I think our viewers will hear very clearly, though, you are declining to give your own view on what those words mean, no, I, having no, said no, that no, words I, matter. I, I, I think I've been, uh, I've been clear that they, they could be taken that way, right? What Lee said was wrong, uh, was it Islamophobic? Result, he was given the opportunity to retract. I think most he people agree that it was factually trip. wrong. But was it Islamophobic? Straight he, answer, yes or no? Well, no, no. He, well, he, straight answer. He was given the opportunity to retract and apologise. I'm giving you an opportunity uh, to answer a straight right, question. So Would you just answer action, the question? Well, let me... No, I won't let well, you go off the point. I, I, I will to, hold you to the question. I, was, was what he said Islamophobic? Richard, can I, yes or no? Richard, can I... Answer the question that but I've already been asked. Would even let me answer the first question? Okay, let's, hit, let's, let's wait for the answer. In my let's own way. Go on. So, what he said was wrong. He shouldn't have said it. That's mm. why firm action was taken. Mm. That's why the whip was taken away, as mm. the Prime Minister said. Uh, I'm not going to get into textual analysis of what he said. It was wrong. That's a very strong word in my book. Uh, it was wrong. He shouldn't have said it. Firm action was taken. Uh, and, and, you know, that, I'm going to leave it there. The words of Lee Anderson, would you regard them as Islamophobic? Well, I've been very clear that what Lee said was 
wrong, it was unacceptable, and that's why we suspended the whip. And it's important that everybody, but particularly elected politicians, are careful with their words and, and do not inflame tensions. But there's a difference between wrong and Islamophobic. Were they Islamophobic? Well, I think the, the most important thing is that the words were wrong. Well, I, I, Nick, res- respectfully, I, I think what Lee said was wrong. Yes. And as a result, of, well, as a result of what he said, he had the, the whip removed from him. That's that's so what was it action. specifically that meant the whip had to go? We agree it was wrong, but why was it wrong? Nick, it, it was wrong. What no, no, Lee why said... Was it wrong? What he said was wrong. As a result of what he said, the whip was removed from him. That was robust action. No, that was why robust was action wrong? that was That's taken. That's what I'm trying to get at. Um, it was wrong, Nick, because of what he said, and robust no, we're action going was taken so as a result. You're, you're well it was t- it was Let's try this a different way. Was it Islamophobic? What he said was wrong, and robust what? action was taken, no. and the whip was removed within 24 but, hours. Minister, was it Islamophobic? And Nick, it was wrong. Minister, I'm going to... And I, I'm never... I'm normally a very polite man. I'm actually going to effectively put the fact... I'll ask you now, for the third time... I've asked you six times why it was necessary. For the third time, was it Islamophobic? Uh, Nick, it was wrong. I'll have to curtail the interview there. I'm grateful for your time, but enough already. Is there any point in me even asking you whether Lee Anderson's comments were racist? Uh, well, they were completely wrong. Were they racist? They were completely wrong... And and so it continues. Ferrari showing there, I mean, brilliantly, what happens if you push the point. I think Cain Burley came close. The other interviews involved Laura Koonsberg on the BBC, Alan Partridge on ITV, uh, Channel 4 News interviewing Rishi Sunak, Nick interviewing Michael Tomlinson, and Kay Burley interviewing Chris Philp. Um, And and Nick showing, really, and I don't mean this necessarily to criticise any of the other interviewers, but you know that I am possibly the biggest fan in the business of that line of questioning where you just don't let them move on you just okay give me the evidence yeah that's fine i hear you but what's what's the evidence but kay burley did it with um with the with the culture secretary talking about the talking about the bbc being biased and she said could you give me some evidence of the bbc being biased and she couldn't she just said i i I, 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 you're sick to death of me doing this but i wrote in my first book that the country would be going to hell in a handcart if journalists didn't start asking for evidence and asking the same question until they got an answer to it i suppose we could chalk it up as better late than never uh it was lucy fraser who, who couldn't come up with any examples whatsoever of bbc bias but it hadn't crossed her mind there wasn't any because all of the news papers whose approval she's desperate for are reporting every day that the BBC is biased. And, th- and there it is. Um, absolutely incontrovertible evidence that the Tory party can't describe Lee Anderson's offence accurately, because if they did so, it would, to paraphrase Michael Caine, it would blow the bloody doors off. <laughs> and they'd all be, they'd all be on the same hook. Um, uh, back to the marches and James Cleverley's uh, opinion that you've made your point now, children, please just go home. And I, sadly, if the killing continues, if, if Netanyahu sends the army into Rafa and God knows how many more children are killed or rendered orphans, then I, at least you've made your point. But stop now, please. Um, because traffic. Natalie's in Elmbridge. Natalie, what would you like to say? Um, It just makes me really cross. I've been on four marches. I've only been on four marches for anything, all of them for this. I'm not that kind of person. You didn't march against the closure of the Uxbridge Library then last month. Okay, carry on, Natalie. You you live with your conscience. I'll live with mine, okay? Yeah, well, exactly. I've marched in four different places just by coincidence. Okay. This last this last weekend, we were in Cardiff visiting my son. That march was grossly over police. Um, there were police lining practically the whole length of it, and for that reason, it was quite. I felt it was quite edgy. Yeah. Okay. It was much worse because it was quite. I've been on. I went on a march in, well, I went on a stand outside Waitrose in Woking. <laughs> and um, I, think I'm like, in Wo- I think I'm in Woking on Saturday. I may well pop into Waitrose well, on my way to the football. Exactly. I didn't go to the stand outside Morrison's in Woking one because I was doing something else. No, but, quite right. Um, um, I mean, a woman's got to have standards, the- Natalie. Well, exactly. Well, exactly. <laughs> but there were three police at the Woking one, which was fine. Right. You know, and at yes. one point they had to come over and tell somebody very good-naturedly to stop saying um, 
from the river to the sea. Right. And the same happened in Guildford. They had to very good-naturedly come over and tell somebody, stop saying from the river to the sea, who I thought was quite, this guy was quite edgy as well. Sure. I, I mean, I, I stress think, again, I did yesterday with someone who was coming at the uh, same point from a slightly different angle, that that is very much uh, a, a phrase that Benjamin Netanyahu's party and Benjamin Netanyahu are very happy to use, very happy to um, exactly. to, to, to campaign on. So, you know, there, there is there are questions surrounding what you've just described, even, but they're, they're not you're not here to answer those questions today. The idea no. the idea that, that, that there is a, a case to stop the marches based on how the marchers behave has possibly fallen apart if James Cleverly is now just saying, you've made your point, please stop. Yeah, yeah. Will you stop? No, no, I won't. I think I I probably will go this Saturday to either Guildford or Woking. But I went up to a London one and I would say, I I was actually, I was probably about 50 feet from a bit of trouble and the police just appeared from nowhere. I have no idea where they all were. Um, you're I reminding me, I've, exactly made a, I've made a couple of jokes about football, oddly, but actually what you're describing reminds me of going to a very big football match where, where the police, because they are there to contain potential trouble spots, can intimidate people who are not there to cause trouble. And uh, uh, even when there is not any trouble, the horses in particular can be... Quite, quite intimidating creatures. Um, this is from Brett, who's in Loughton. Mm, that's two Bretts in two days. Okay, interesting. Uh, you're such a hypocrite, James. Where is your evidence that 30,000 people have been killed in Gaza? I'm sorry, Brett. You're, you're probably right. I'm pretty confident that the number is much higher, uh, as, as will become clear when people are actually allowed to start sifting through the rubble of the buildings that have been raised to the ground. But, but in the meantime, that's a figure that most international organizations seem to be comfortable with but you're quite right it could turn out to be lower or much much higher james o'brien on lbc four minutes after 11 is the time um of course uh, the, the 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 question raised by brett um not that one a different one uh, the other one has had quite an interesting backstory i don't know if you caught up with that call that went viral yesterday but goodness me talk about um yeah, talk about opening a Pandora's box. But another Brett has been in touch to complain about us working upon the only available figures for, for the death toll in Gaza. Figures that are not actually disputed, I don't think, by the Israeli government, although they claim to know exactly how many people uh, of those 30,000 dead are actually Hamas fighters. Um, and part of the problem, of course, is that you, where else are you going to get your information from? So I would, before we move on to a completely different story... I would just draw your attention to something that, again, depending upon where you get your news, and that oddly is the topic we're going to talk about next, um, you may not be aware of. More than 55 foreign correspondents, including some of the biggest names, in the biggest and best names in the business, have issued a plea for access to Gaza through Israel and Egypt, saying it would help them bolster the efforts of local journalists whose safety is at risk. I will certainly not be using this as a hook and tease, but I wonder if you know how many journalists have been killed so far. I presume Brett would dispute this figure, but we rely upon their employers for for, for the information. Do you know how many would you say had been killed so far in this conflict? 90. 90 journalists killed so far. Um... The the letter is designed to win access to the area for journalists who would be able to relieve some of the local journalists already there. Getting foreign correspondents in has proved close to impossible, which is why these 55 have signed an open letter collectively and sent it to both the Israeli and the Egyptian embassies in London, urging, and I quote, free and unfettered access to Gaza for all foreign Media. They add that it's vital that local journalist safety is respected and that their efforts are bolstered by the journalism of members of the international media. And uh, there is, a, I'll retweet the article from the Press Gazette that um, brought this to my attention. And you can see all of the people that have signed this uh, uh, if you do that. Um, and they're all broadcasters, it's it's fair to say. Oddly enough, n- none of them seem to be from the relatively new organisations that have popped up on your television dial recently. I don't know why that would be, but um, nothing there from 
either Rupert Murdoch's Talk TV or GBB's, um, where, of course, one of the owners last week was found to have been liking on his social media the, the, the kind of posts that make Lee Anderson look like a, a, a moderate, sensible man. Seven minutes after 11 is the time. So we move on. And we move on to a story which, in a way, has some relevance to the thing I just told you about getting journalists into Gaza. Because there's some research published today um, suggesting that young people get most of their news from social media. To which you might respond by saying, oh, really? And is the Pope a Catholic? Or, you're not going to believe this, James, but you're not going to believe where bears go to the toilet. It's in the woods. Uh, young people get most of their information from social... Have you ever met a young person? Uh, this is a, a story in the Times today. The second bit of the paragraph possibly makes it newsworthy. I'm not sure. But uh, the, the, the idea that we should be shocked that young people get most of their news from social media, which, of course, often contains links to what you might describe as traditional media, uh, doesn't strike me as being particularly interesting. It's a little bit dog bites man. The second bit is is more alarming, perhaps, potentially. It says that even, well, they get most of their news from social media, even though they think that it is far less trustworthy than television or newspapers. So they've polled people aged from 18 to 24. They're twice as likely to get their news from TikTok than the BBC. Uh, and four in 10 say they follow the news but get their information from social media websites, even though they think they are less trustworthy than TV, news websites and newspapers. Only 23% get their news from television and 13% get their news from newspapers. I'm going to have to change my act, aren't I? And stop telling me about the lavatorial habits of polar bears. It's a well-established figure of speech that bears in the woods, all right? Um, I'm going to have to change my act slightly because I, I get very exercised by the bile that is fed into the bloodstream of the public by newspapers, which, of course, are becoming less and less influential, except for elderly people who, or older people who tend to lean to the right, which is why the newspapers that feed their uh, prejudices remain or, or, or become ever more unpleasant. Um, I don't normally do phone-ins predicated on the question, so what? But I might today... I want to know why you think... Or, no, not even why. I want to know whether you think this is a problem. And I need to be very careful. I need to guard against two things. I need to guard against, one, my job, which has been since I stopped measuring inside legs on Regent Street uh, as a member of the media to uh, various roles, but both in print and broadcast, in newspapers, television and radio, and now podcast as well, of course. So all of it, I think. I don't think there's much left, is there? Uh, I'm also an influencer. I don't know if you knew that. Well, if you didn't know that, then I'm probably not. But anyway, that, so that, I've got to guard against that. I've got to guard against protectionism or loyalty to, to my own profession. All right. But of course, clips from this program and some others go bonkers on social media. So you might say you're getting your news from TikTok, but actually you're watching a J-O-B monologue or, or, um, or, or the dismantling of a slightly unfortunate caller. And that would count. That's why I'm a little bit sceptical about the conclusions we're supposed to draw from this research. And the second thing I have to guard against is, is there a word for it where, where you allow your own experiences to cloud out objectivity? So your, your, well, your subjectivity clouds out objectivity. So you're so convinced that your own very specific experience is completely illustrative. That you, we got a call yesterday from someone who denied that poverty existed because he went to a restaurant and it was full. So that, 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 is there a word for that? The, the idea, I mean, it would be a bit, bit like saying, I've never had a cold, therefore the cold doesn't exist. I've never had, I've never had flu, therefore flu is invented. I need to be careful of that because I have children. I have teenage children, one of whom actually now fits into this category of 18 to 24-year-olds. And they're pretty well informed, but they also get a lot of stuff off social media. They will ask me questions, particularly the younger one, based upon what they've seen on TikTok or what they've seen not, not so much on Instagram, if I've understood correctly. That doesn't seem to be a place where you're likely to get much news-based stuff. But also, you know, 
it's a very big day in a young person's life when their friends at school start telling them that they've seen their dad on TikTok. And so that's me. And I am mainstream media or legacy media or proper media or whatever you want to call it. And I also happen to live in a country where you can't trust a newspaper as far as you can throw it. So what exactly is it that we're supposed to be worried about when we learn that young people get most of their news from uh, social media, even though they trust it less than, and they say television or newspapers, but they mean television. I, I Listen, the BBC, ITV, Channel 4 News, by far, and, and, and our news bulletins, our news bulletins, by far the most trustworthy news you'll get anywhere. Daily Mail today has got a comment piece that says, it's high time our virtue signalling ruling class stopped pandering to people who despise Britain. Guess how many people it names? as evidence of the central thesis of the article. So you would think, wouldn't you, if the entire ruling class was embarked upon the business of pandering to people who despise Britain, then somebody called Matt Goodwin would be able to name them, right? This is, this is obvious. It's an entire ruling class, man, and they're pandering to people who despise Britain. So I actually read the article which are things I do for you. I actually read the article. If you ever needed proof that our ruling class is utterly adrift from the rest of Britain, then just look at the reaction to, and inevitably it's, it's the Islamophobic comments from Lee Anderson and I think probably Suella Braverman or someone else. So you see that headline. It's high time our virtue signalling ruling class stopped pandering to people who despise Britain. How many people do you think it names? How many people do you think it names as proof of the point being made on the main comment piece of the best-selling newspaper in the country? Go on, have a guess. No, nope, lower. Have another guess. No, nope, lower. Seriously, the, the entire ruling class, the virtue-signalling ruling class is pandering to people who despise Britain. What examples do you think this character provides? How many? How many examples do you think this character provides? Go on, have another guess. No, nope, lower. Yeah, that's right, actually. Nada. I'll do that for the benefit of people watching the programme later on YouTube. Zilch. Zero. Niche. Not one. So that's, that's what you're supposed to be cross. Oh my God, they're believing what they see on TikTok. And they're not believing this clown in the Daily Mail claiming that the ruling class is pandering to the people who despise Britain without being able to name a single one. A single one. Not even Gary Lineker or Owen Jones or me gets a mention because it would be demonstrably untrue but they still need to continue frightening their uh their readers and the daily express i think has come out claiming lee anderson can't be racist because he speaks for the conservative party membership should we have a little stop and think about that you can't be racist because you speak for the conservative party membership now who was it that beat rishi sunak to the leadership a couple of years ago oh yes the worst prime minister we've ever had uh, according to most measures, although Boris Johnson runs a close on other measures. So what was it about Rishi Sunak that made the Conservative Party membership choose Liz Truss? What could it have been? Oh, I don't know. Maybe they really like women. Could be. That Could it be? No. What? So Lee Anderson on the front page of the Daily Express trying to prove that he's not racist by claiming that he speaks for the Tory party membership, the people that thought Liz Truss was a more suitable candidate to be prime minister than Rishi Sunak. I don't know. I, I can't think what the answer might be. Um, 15 minutes after 11 is the time. So how, how scared? Well, there's two questions here. Why are young people... Uh, why are young people relying more on social media? There's three questions here. I'm going to make you work. I worked so I had to read that bilge in the mail for you today. So the least you can do is a bit of heavy lifting for me today. So I've got three questions for you. Why are young people getting most of their news from social media? 0345 6060973. Is that a problem? 0345 6060973. Is that a problem? And I've forgotten what the third question is. And the third question would be, what, what, what will it do? What, 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 I mean, it's a bit like the second question, is that a problem? But what would worry you about this? Paige points out, she's surprised that article in the mail didn't mention Prince Harry. So th th those are the questions. Why are you, as an 18 to 24-year-old, or somebody there or thereabouts, much, much, much more likely to get your news from social media than 
trad media, I'm going to call it, because I'm quite hip like that, trad media. Um, why do you trust it less? Why would they say that? Well, I, what I really want is someone who can explain this phenomenon to me in a slightly more sophisticated and nuanced way than a few statistics in a Times article allow. Because I think that that's quite a healthy thing. I think that media studies as a proper academic pursuit teaches you to be a little bit sceptical of anything that is imbued with opinion. That's why the BBC Channel 4 ITV news are so valuable to us now, because they don't have opinions. Everywhere else you go, there are opinions. BBC has been slightly infected by opinions because, of course, they've got this chap Robbie Gibb on the board, a deliberate appointment designed to try and steer the corporation in the direction of, of what he and his ilk stand for. Uh, but generally speaking, you don't get any opinion. So what I think these young people are doing is watching a clip on TikTok and recognising the fact that that's not necessarily the unvarnished truth, but it's an engaging opinion. It would obviously be a bit weird for an LBC presenter to start railing against uh, news-based broadcasting that is imbued with opinion. But you can tell the blooming difference between what I do on the programme and what Thomas does when the news bulletin starts. So uh, Thomas is completely trustworthy. I get stuff wrong. But I get stuff wrong, hopefully, in an engaging and compelling fashion. And, of course, because it's a phone-in show, you can then ring me up and tell me that you um, disagree. And sometimes you'll even prove me wrong, as indeed some of my Scottish callers did last week when we were talking about Lindsay Hoare's decision to go with Labour's amendment to the, to the SNP motion on the ceasefire in Gaza. That, for me, was a school day. So I can't trust what James O'Brien said that day, but it was still valuable and interesting. And the whole process of changing his mind live on air, which I don't know, may have got clipped up on YouTube or not, was um, was powerful. So I don't want the questions to be too vague, but I, I'm not going to apologise for there being so many. Question number one, why? It seems to me this is a bit like complaining about young people watching television or having smartphones. Of course they're going to get their news from the thing what's in their pocket. But you tell me why you think young people are getting their news from social media, 03456060973. And then knit together question two and three, just to, just to make it simpler. I, I don't think this is a problem, is it? I don't think this is a problem. YouTube, maybe, and you go down a rabbit hole. And I know TikTok's got algorithms as well. But I don't really think this is a problem, particularly not when our newspapers are so bent they think down is up and left is right. How can anybody complain about social media being untrustworthy when you've got clowns like this in the Daily Mail writing about a virtue signalling ruling class that is pandering to the people who despise Britain but can't give you a single actual example? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. I guess... That this is my confirmation bias, if that's the phrase I was looking for earlier. Uh, I, I don't have a particular problem with this because I can't see the particular problem from where I sit. But if you sit somewhere else, you possibly can see a particular problem, in which case I want you to describe it to me. Hit the numbers now. You will get through. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 23 minutes after 11 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the question of why, why does it matter that young people are more likely to get their news from social media than more traditional outlets? Um, I'm possibly indulging in my own privilege when I say, well, the young people I know do that and they're perfectly fine. Taz is embarking to kick things off. Taz, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, so I'm like ex-teacher who spent a lot of time working with young people and then moved into the diversity and inclusion world and I had to engage a lot with like Gen Z talent, okay. worked for one of the biggest advertising agencies in the world and I had to like get into the thick of this stuff. And so you, you, I, you, you, you have to work out how to reach the young people you used to teach? That's right, yeah. Okay. I'm still working. I'm, I essentially bridge the gap between the large corporates that are trying to engage with like minority communities and underrepresented young people, but okay. also give a voice and platform to those young people. And yeah. I think I've been listening in, and I, there's just so much I want to say, but I'll try and keep it um, succinct. The the shift to social media, I think, threatens mainstream media because control is probably the wrong word. There's less of a filter mm. when young people are taking in news from, from social media. But the, 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 what, the reason we've set ourselves up for failure is because one of the biggest reasons I quit teaching was because we never taught young people critical thinking skills we expected them the education system is set up in a way where 
we expect to just feed information to young people and they should just accept the way history is taught. They should accept the way policy is taught. And they're not really allowed to question. And what's happening now is the danger of social media, there's pros and cons, right, um, James? The, the pros are sort of unfiltered access to information. What we're seeing with, you know, live events happening in the Middle East right now, we're getting unfiltered access to, from journalists on the ground. But at the same time, we, we're having young people blindly believe the first thing they read. In some cases, not but, all. But, but, and old people as well. People believe what they read in the Daily Mail, which is why I'm not that oh, worried yeah. about... But no, I'm not, that's not, I, I didn't mean yeah. that to be funny. That's why I'm not that worried about young people. How, how, can yeah. it, I mean, how can we be having a swing at them when the, 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 you know, the Daily Express is telling us that Lee Anderson can't possibly be racist because the Tory party membership agrees with him? Yeah, I, no, I 100% agree. And I think that the danger is not teaching. I mean, we, we seem to be less accountable with the older generation who, like you said, many of them are far more right-leaning than the younger generation. And I think the other difference is that there's a growing, I mean, some people refer to it as wokeness because I work in this industry of, of de and I. I'm around that language all the time. And call it what you will, there is a growing consciousness among Gen Z. The stats will show you, you know, the Paul Polman report will show you that over 80% of young people won't work for a business unless they have ESG commitments, they're a sustainable business, they create social impact, but many of them won't work for gambling, alcohol companies. And with that growing consciousness, mm. there's also an understanding with these young people that they recognize that those who make it into mainstream media, for the most part, I would say for the majority, not to speak in, in ultimatums, but um, for the most part, people that make it into mainstream media, into high profile journalist roles into, you know, who write newspaper articles, any of them come from a very, uh, they're all from very similar backgrounds, a, a particular educational background, That's true. particular lived experience. And so if Gen Z feel that, you know, mainstream media or news articles are more geared towards a, a particular viewpoint that is represented across media, they're less likely to believe it. You know, some people call that wokeness. I would say it's a growing consciousness and, and actually critical thinking, which we've lacked in the education system for such a long time. And that shift, I think, threatens what mainstream media have managed to do for a long time, which is, you know... I, 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 I just have to keep an eye on what I'm poised to push back against and why I'm poised to push back against it. And I can't push back against your... I mean, there, there are... I, I, I mean, the media is a hell of a lot more diverse than it was when I was a young man, yeah. but nowhere yeah. near as diverse as the country in which I live in, in many uh -huh. ways. Um, although statistically, representation is probably uh, close to fair. It certainly, once you start moving up the ladder and getting into very senior positions, it, it, it ceases to be so, much more so in management than, than in, in on-air talent. Yeah. Um, but the... Some of the stuff you said I don't quite follow as being part of this process. Because which, which, well, why, why would you not want to work? I mean, you mean that you wouldn't want to work for a gambling company? What's that got to do with trusting social media more than you trust, or, or getting more of your news from social media than you do from traditional media? Gambling adverts are all over social media and traditional media. Yeah, of course. What I mean is that the shifting consciousness in young people mean it's oh, just another example of, of a shifting yeah, consciousness. It, yeah. And then, and then the final thought I have sure. um, is that this might be as much about. Well, actually, the problem is that the newspapers in this country are completely untrustworthy, but the broadcast media is actually pretty solid. It's just under constant attack from the kind of people who buy the bills that the newspapers are peddling. Channel Four News, ITV, BBC do a really, really good job, and they're regulated by Ofcom, effectively. And so I would worry that young people thought that they were part of the process and the problem you described, except perhaps on the diversity front. Yeah, and I, and I also think, too, I agree with that, and I also think with the representation point, representation a lot of the time sometimes is, call it what you will, virtue thing. there's a lot of lip service involved in that. We might see, I might see, I'm, so I'm South Asian um, by mm. descent, Muslim, Muslim by faith. I might see someone who looks like me um, in decision-making spaces, but actually they've come from a really privileged background. Yeah, we you know, talked Rishi, about this Rishi. a bit yesterday, actually, but class and race yeah. being inextricable. Inextricable. Yeah. But that, so, rep, yeah, so you can't be what you can't see, and representation goes further than that. It makes you think that this news is not for me. It's not a question of whether it's trustworthy or not. It's just not for me, which is odd to a white bloke, think, but, but that's part of the problem. Of I think it's a blend of both, James. It's kind of saying, well, this news isn't for me, and part of the reason it's not for me is because the person who wrote it doesn't understand the experience. The news of the is news. 
But or needs is that is, bias, yeah, no, needs you're right. bias. Well, You and I are both biased in so many ways. Speak for yourself, so, mate. <laughs> 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 and that filters through into, into journalism. And I think the next generation are... The other difference that I'm, I wanted to mention is that when I watch, you know, growing up, the only access we had to the outside world, um, being born in the 80s, the only access we had to the outside world was 6 o'clock news with my mum and dad on yes. the TV. And I think the, the difference that social media gives me is that when I read an article or I see a post from, let's say, an independent, um, you know, you've got the likes of Navarra Media, you've got TRT World. When I read an article from there, I'm able to scroll, scroll down and actually understand what the dialogue is from people in different parts of the world. Yes. Watching the BBC News on TV or reading a newspaper article doesn't give me that choice. And so things like Twitter slash X and Instagram, it's opening up a world of, actually, I might read something, you know, the hopes are that someone who's uh, got really extreme views might read something, agree with it, and scroll down into the comments and start to shift the narrative in their mind and say, well, no, actually, hold on, maybe I might be that's wrong. That's why I come to work every day, is that, is that hope that you've just described, which is perhaps why I'm not, not, not the best member of the traditional media to be spooked by what you describe. I, I think the value of being able to challenge what the prevailing narrative is is, um, is absolutely immense. The problem I've got, and, and Taz, that was the perfect call in many ways, and you've opened up more lines of inquiry than I appreciated were already there, but... Um, that's the problem for me. And you're right that everything has a bias of sorts, whether it's a post-imperial bias or, or, or a political bias or whatever it is. But the difference between the bilge punted by the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail and the Daily Express that still influence huge sectors of our public discourse, that bias is nuclear. Uh, the bias of a of a of a of an impartial news organisation is reflected in what stories they choose to report. For example. Um, the, the, the gammon contingent today would want us to be reporting on the farmers' protests in France because they're so ill-informed they think that somehow has a bearing upon Brexit. Farmers in France have been protesting uh, about everything forever. And some of the uh, restrictions that are being placed upon them for environmental reasons um, are causing enormous upset in the farming community. You should be more worried if you're a patriotic Brit about how British farmers are responding to the consequences of the Brexit that you voted for. But there, there, there is a form of bias there. People in this country aren't reporting that heavily on the, Brit on the French farmers' protests because they don't really matter in the context of your reader's life story. But if you're a massive gammon and you're desperate to pretend that Brexit isn't just an absolute crock of nonsense, then you might want to see more reports of, of French farmers' protests. So there, there are bi biases in the... Dis I'm biased, even if I was the most impartial presenter that you've ever encountered, which I'm categorically not. I'm biased in, 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 in selecting the things that we talk about every day. There's a bias there. Bias isn't always a negative word. Sometimes it's an inevitable consequence of humanity. Why are you talking about this today? Why am I talking about this story today? Because I'm biased in favour of stories about the media. Because my dad was a journalist and I work in it. And it involves young people and I've got to. I'm, there's, all, there's bias everywhere. So I'm not yet worried. In fact, I'm possibly encouraged by the news that young people get most of their news from social media. And I'd remind you of John Stewart's points. John Stewart just says everything's a television now. This thing you've got in your hand, right? You say, oh, they're not watching television. This is a television. Oh, it's just different channels, some of which are... It's like Wayne's World. Do you remember Wayne's World? We were all amazed they had their own television channel in the bottom of their house. Wayne and Garth uh, sitting there. Oh, that's Bill and Ted. Wayne and Garth, give me, a, give me a Wayne's World catchphrase quickly. What was a Wayne's World catchphrase? Come on! Oh, doing a party on, dudes. Was that Wayne and was that Wayne? So that was that was their own television station in the bottom. And because you were watching it on a traditional television, you thought it was television, but it might as well be, it might as well be on TikTok. This is a television. This is a television, it's a screen. So everything on it has a salience, everything. So the trick is, the danger is, the stuff being produced by liars and charlatans and conspiracy theorists and white supremacists and racists looks exactly like the stuff being created by trustworthy people who still have their biases. That's, that's the problem. And that's why some people are so desperate to actually start television stations that look like proper news stations, but actually just involve very right-wing politicians interviewing each other. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC.
11.38 is the time. Uh, the young people get their news from social media, even though they think it's far less trustworthy than television or newspapers. So, and I'm not buying it. For a start, it would be impossible to be less trustworthy than most newspapers and some television stations in, in this country at this time. Um, but it's possible I'm missing something. Halla is in Shepherd's Bush. Halla, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Uh, good morning. Hi. I'm good, thank you. I'm on my day off from the pharmacy world. So Fantastic. What better way to spend it than calling you? <laughs> so I have a 13-year-old. I don't know if I've mentioned this to you before, but she's about to make her choices for GCSEs. And lo and behold, she has chosen to pick history. Now, I'm actually looking at the history curriculum for her school. And this is one sure way to make me want to give her the push towards getting news from social media. As you know, you may remember, I'm half I'm, I'm yes. Sudanese. And she's half Sudanese. At the moment, we've got a war in Sudan. There is no media that is covering it. The only media that's covering Sudan is when there is somebody crossing the channel to come over to the, to the UK. And that's not the news that I want my children to grow up listening to. No. So I will push them towards a wider and more diverse and more wholesome media to look at it. To look at if the B, if you're looking at the BBC, they do world news at midnight at one a.m. What child should be up watching that? And at the moment, it is totally unbalanced. As I've said to you before, the language is really dumbed down to appeal to certain factions of society what do you and mean I'm by that what that. do you mean what do you mean by that i think the last time i rang you i was speaking to you about how the language in the media has changed to stop the boats uh you know along the lines of build the wall and yeah. and it's just something that has really really is sticking in my crawl and i mentioned to you last time again and i'm going to say it again because all my friends laughed so i'll do it again <laughs> I feel- <laughs> this is the greatest hits of hala i didn't know that was on the agenda today <laughs> Self-promotion, James. But Nothing I said it to that. you last time. I feel like I'm in a, an abusive relationship living yes. in the UK at the moment. And it's really, really painful. And now I'm responsible for two young women. I am finding it extra hard to try and fight against the tide of this whole, you know, just the hostility, the, the, the way I feel right now. I, I really don't want to have to pass this on to them. So I have to find another out. Do you know, I have to find I, another way. I, 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 there's a book out tomorrow by Tom Burgess uh, called <laughs> Where the Rich Owned the Truth. And um, and I think I think it would really resonate with you. We're probably going to talk, yeah. we must talk to Tom about it actually. But it essentially looks at a fight to control reality, which is part of what you've just described. And, and that's why I normally find myself sticking up for um, uh, organisations like the BBC, Channel 4 News, um, LBC News, our, our news station. I, and I think we do a pretty good job on here of balancing opinion out during the course of yeah. the day. But, uh, you know, that doesn't really help if you, if, you object, if you object to the rhetoric of stop the boats or calling refugees illegal immigrants, then you, you're going to hear it, even if you're going to hear people like me pushing back against it. So that, that the stuff that happens... At the lower level is more dangerous to you because you can you can call out the stuff that's happening at the higher level, but it's the seeping yes. influences, and that that's a really yeah. good example. The way that the phrase "stop the boats" has has sort of ceased, if it ever was, to be properly challenged. Yeah, yeah, and I feel like right now when I speak to somebody like you, I feel like I get this is quite cathartic when I speak to you. But as I'm looking at this piece of paper in front of me of what my daughter is going to learn in her history GCSEs, yeah. I despair. Yes? Yeah, because of course. Because there's nothing that reflects her. There is absolutely nothing. So she will need to go into lesser-known media. She's, she will go to, you know, Navara media. She will go to all the media that will reflect who we are and represent a little bit of what we believe in, not this tidal But are they not? But I mean, surely there's... An, there's an, I'm not familiar with the one that you mentioned. Is that where Ash Sarka works? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the station, but she, she seems to be a very um, healthy contributor to public discourse. But, but, I mean, her... I don't know if she's representative of the... What is it? A TV station or a website or...? It's, it's it's online. Okay, we but, don't, but, we that's, sit down but it's heavily TikTok. opinionated, <laughs> surely. I mean, if you're looking for unbiased coverage, I don't know that mm-hmm. that's the kind of place you'd go, is it? But but it's but 
but this is the thing. This is unbiased towards the other end, and then we. No, there's no such make thing as that. Mind. There's no such. Yeah, no, but no. The, so what do you watch to balance it out? Fox News. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is these are opinions of people. Yes, yeah, so yeah, but I'm not talking about opinions. I've got opinions to... coming out of my ears. I'm looking for news. Yeah, but the news that we want to watch. But the news is, is not an opinion. Is Al Jazeera. Or is okay, it? So we is want it? To yeah, watch okay. Now Al Jazeera makes yeah. sense because they're pointing so cameras at things and they're pointing cameras at things and showing you the pictures. Yes, but Al Jazeera, I listen to Navarra Media, I watch the BBC News, I watch Sky News, I read newspapers. I'm saying to you that we can't just be on the traditional media. Nobody um, is anymore. Train. Nobody is but anymore. That's what, so we agree. Yeah, so we, we usually do. Young people. We usually do. Be, so so we don't need to be. The only people who are going to be spooked like this are aging former newspaper yes. journalists who now work on the radio who lack the self awareness yes. of me. And my self awareness is largely due to people like you. Yes. Is that it? Have we covered and, it? Have we got and, it? And, and, and can I say one more thing, James? Yes. I wanted to call you yesterday because I was off for two days. And I okay. wanted to call you yesterday. And one of the things that I think you cover really well is when you speak to people who are meeting hostility day on their daily life. You mm. know, you're meeting hostility on their daily life. You are meeting racism, Islamophobia, because I tick all these boxes. But when I'm at work, in my firm, if I'm in a pharmacy... Mm. I, I actually, you know, strangely do not experience any of this. Cause it, so it is location dependent. It's dependent on where you are. So yeah. somebody walks into the pharmacy, they don't give me any trouble because they need my help and they also see me as a responsible member of the community. But if I get on the bus, that very same person could very easily spout some racist stuff to my face openly. Yes. And this has been normalised. And what's happened lately with 30p lead is an indication of I, how I, I, so, I, I, Well, it, on both levels, not only that it happened, but also that on some level, he and people like him don't, don't really understand what it is that he's done wrong. No, that's that's no, the normalisation, no. not, just, not just the outburst, but the failure to understand it's, it's your, own outburst, your own it's outburst. It's the aftermath. Yeah, it's the aftermath. I Gosh, could talk thank to you, you all day, but I've got a dishwasher to unload. So. Well, I, I did, yeah, I've, it's not the first time in my life I've lost out to a dishwasher, Halle, but it's the first time it's ever happened live on the radio. <laughs> Mind, there you go. Thank you for listening. It's, thank you. It's 11.45. PMQ's on the way, don't forget, at 12. I've um, got an interesting, another interesting story from our friend Peter Gagan um, coming up a little later for you as well. So there is uh, uh, still quite a lot to get through. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10 to 12 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. This is a really, really helpful message, and I'd like to thank you for it, Ava, who describes herself as a 20-year-old student who listens to my show and follows Politics Joe, which is generally where I get my news from. I find it helpful to see the main headlines on news Instagram accounts, and I keep in touch with politics, but the more traditional news can feel like a bombardment of negativity and a headache of agendas regarding crime, the bias of right-wing media and GB News, for example. Mainly reading the headlines and the important news feels more positive for my mental health, and I think it's a stereotype that young people don't think critically or are woke, when I would rather get neutral news and be able to debate and question it. As you said, I don't trust the traditional news because I don't find it relatable. It wasn't really me that said that, it was Naz. And it tends to feel like an attack on young people, like all the Daily Mail headlines saying that we're lazy when we aren't. You've, you've sort of chased young people away then, if you're from a certain part of traditional media. I, I do think, and I probably would say this, wouldn't I, that LBC is, is arguably separate from this debate, separate from this conversation for, for, for reasons. But the idea that I should be worried about people like Ava getting their news from places other than the Daily Mail seems to me to be ridiculous. There is some other research in the, there was some other findings in the same research about deep fakes that are more concerning, but I'm not sure they lend themselves particularly to a phone-in. It's really just about doubling down or confirmation bias or um, lost sunk cost fallacy. Uh, you bought into an opinion, and even when you're shown that the evidence upon which that opinion is built is false... You cling to the opinion. Um, so, so, so people for the same research, I think, or, or certainly by the same communications firm, were shown deep fakes of Sadiq Khan and Keir Starmer. 
I don't know why just those two, actually. Why wouldn't you show them deep fakes of, of Rishi Sunak and Susan Hall? But anyway, d- d- well, here we go. It's a communications firm run by um, Lee Kane, who used to work for Boris Johnson. Uh, you let them form opinions, and then you tell them that the videos weren't real, but they stand by the opinions anyway. Uh, if, if, crucially, it reinforced their existing values or prejudices. So you start off with a prejudice. Someone shows you a deep fake. It proves your prejudice. Then they tell you that the deep fake is wrong. It doesn't make you question your prejudice. Uh, maybe not quite as shocking as it looks at first glance. Uh, Mark's in Wakefield. Mark, what made you pick up the phone? Uh, morning, James. Hello. Hi. I, I need to be careful here because I have Parkinson's so my, my, my addiction may go off. I'm, I'm hey, take all the bit. time you want. All the time you want, Mark. Thank you, thank you my friend. Um, I, I, have, um, I, I rung in because I, I, I listened to you today late and I've really sw- switched on to the news and, and politics. Um, I have a 19-year-old daughter that's, that's at university uh, and gets all her news from social media. She's got very strong opinions on things, but yeah. very well. Um, yes. Not research, but, uh, but you know, she, she understands. Uh, she, she can um, figure, figure things out in her head. Uh, I also have, uh, I have a, a mum who I love very much. I'm very, very careful about what I say. <laughs> Who's in her 70s, who gets a copy of The Times every day from the paper shop and the rest of the news from Facebook. <laughs> and it's it's quite incredible to see, you know, my 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 lovely uh, moderate mother who uh, I, I, we we see now we have conversations and and then the the odd, the odd comment gets thrown in about I, I see the I, I see they're the really clamping down on the small boats now and I, I, you know I see I see the the clamping down on crime and uh, as though it's, it's so that is I mean that is the narrative your mum is being fed and therefore regurgitating. Yeah, yeah, and you know, in, 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 in a way, and, and I, I, you know, I used to, I used to say, but hang on a minute, mum, you know, this, this party has been in charge for fourteen years now, and um, you know, these these policies have been in charge, or this this piece of money that they're announcing, you know, the, the four point seven billion pound or whatever for the North. Thank, thank you, so God bless you. Yes. Um, from the, from the, you know, it was it was already kind of promising the budget anyway, and this is just reannouncing old old stuff. So I have this strange conversation, and then sometimes I just choose not to. Not to pursue it because I, you know, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to. You don't want to have a row. You don't want to have a row. Yeah. I get, I get then, that. I, 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 yeah. I don't know that there is um, an, an opposite to that, is there? I, I, I don't. I don't want to both well, sides anything, but I don't know what that would look like trying to persuade people that that you know it, most immigrants are nice. Not, I mean, that, it's it, just yeah. the truth. I mean, <laughs> what, what's it? Well, yeah, it, it's just the truth, and it's, and it's ridiculous to say otherwise, you know. Um, and um, and the, the the other side of the coin is is my nineteen year old daughter, who's who's very um, she's she's like a hundred times me, so she's yeah. very passionate about things and about people and, and about causes, and she's very switched on to what's going on in the world. And uh, you know, so she's got very strong views on 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 you know on, on trans rights. She's got very strong views on what's happening in uh, in, in Gaza. Uh, and, all, and all this kind of thing that's informed by her, her friends and, and, and stuff that she reads, and you know, and her, and, and her critical thinking. What's what's kind of worrying though is that you know we we agree on some we, no we agree on most things, and some things you know are kind of out my my remit. So I, I, I tend to dance around it, um, like a dad does. Yes. But what, what's worrying is is that you know my mum will always vote the way that she she's voted in the past, and I, I don't know what that is because I don't ask her. Mm. But my daughter, my daughter, you know, is is. Not turned on by anything the Labour are doing at the moment. No, and, and her friends are, and that's. Well, how much? You know, how much of that is her newsfeed, and how much of that is Labour? I wonder. I, I think it's it's a combination of both because yes, you know what, be. what, she, what she sees, what you know what Keir Starmer, for instance, sees as trying to appease everybody. She just sees as kind of ambivalent to it, you know. So it doesn't really care about the people in Gaza, and that is a line yeah, that is it, going. She's going to be hit over the yeah. head with that quite often from. Yeah. Um, from from you know very opinionated yeah. outlets that that are yeah. passionately pro Palestinian people, and and Keir Starmer yeah. is not. He doesn't come across as being passionately pro Palestinian people. But so it's, uh, yeah, I mean it's but a it, tough it, one, it, isn't it? it? it, it, it yeah, and it comes across as trying to please, trying, because he's trying to please everybody all at the same time. He's trying you to know, be fair, mean, I think. Oh, well, it's the same thing okay, as what you okay, just said. Yeah. But but she okay, feels there's yeah. a, there's a clear side to be picked. Yeah, and, and the, he you hasn't know, the picked polls, one. Yeah, and you know my my daughter will walk in when the news is on, and and you know and, and come out with, and she's well fed about the the facts of the, the situation and give me her, her opinion. But otherwise, she wouldn't sit down and watch the news. Any more than you know, my my uh, you know my my mum would tune into you in the morning. 
Um, yeah. uh, the, you oh, know, hang on a minute. This is taking a turn. What's going on? Turn. What do you mean? Get, get, flip it up. Buy a radio for Christmas. I'll, I'll, I'll get, get it tuned in. I shall make a, I'll make a specially welcome. I'll roll out a red carpet. I know you're right. And, and I, I, I mean, that, I guess the, the chicken and egg question kicks on now, doesn't it? Is, is, do young people and old people, if old people care more about the issues that they're constantly being spoon fed by their media choices, then is that part of the reason why young people care more about the issues that they do? And you mentioned transgender rights and the situation in Gaza. The, 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 I, I mean, the case is pretty strong, isn't it? I don't know where the chicken is and, and, and where the egg is. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for, for calling me today as well. I really appreciate it. It's coming up to 11.58. Uh, this fellow doesn't. Self-awareness, he says, irrespective of whether one agrees with you, it's your smug, holier-than-thou attitude that aggravates and disgusts. Natasha, I've asked you not to text me while I'm at work. <laughs> Do, does it not concern you that you have such an inflated view of yourself and certainly of your intelligence which actually isn't all that other than in comparison with many of your callers. Well, I, listen, I don't mean to be even smugger than usual, but I was being sarcastic when I talked about my self-awareness. I was, I was taking the mickey out of Nick when I said uh, elderly ex-newspaper men on the radio um, who lack the self-awareness to realise that they're part of the problem. I was completely um, nodding towards the idea that both Nick Ferrari and I fall into that category and sarcastically suggesting that I didn't. But obviously, if I have to explain a joke to you, then the joke hasn't worked very well, albeit that that on this occasion is almost certainly your fault rather than mine. As you may have gathered, Natasha Clark has put down her phone, stopped texting the studio and prepared to predict what might come up in PMQs in the next few minutes. Hello, James. Um, Hello. I think it's obviously... Oh, sorry, Natasha. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go on. Uh, I've just got to respond to this. Uh, hi, James. Just checking if this works. George. George, it's, wor it's, George, it's working, mate. Uh, George has been in touch. He's been using the WhatsApp facility coming into the studio now. 0345 973 if you want to WhatsApp us. Just thought, you know, priorities and everything. Very important to let George... George, Matt, George, George, George! It's working. It's working fine, mate. You keep them coming. Sorry, Natasha. Back to you. George was making a cup of tea in the next room and, and didn't hear you. Through, George. Um, I think the Islamophobia row that's obviously been dominating and you have been talking about for the last six days is obviously going to feature at PMQs. There you go. What will the question be? What did Lee Anderson do wrong? I mean, can you call it Islamophobic? What why did he do you, wrong? You, Nick, yeah. Nick, 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 they, they came out a little. Nick. Yes, they came out a little bit better today with Chris Philp, the Home Office Minister, starting to try and unpick a little bit more of did the you argument. Hear, did, really? Did you see him with Kate Burley? Well, on, on Nick's program okay. earlier today, he did. Didn't uh, go, on our, our own that? radio station, clip, he did. Clip five, Keith. Have you got the Chris Philp one? It's only very short. Have we got it? Can we do it? Can we get it? Have you got it? Are we good? George, stay I there. I can mate. read Keep it to you. No, 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 no. This is here. We go. Is there any point in me even asking you whether Lee Anderson's comments were racist? Oh, they were completely wrong. Were they racist? They were completely wrong. I think he should apologise, which he hasn't done yet, um, because the way he characterised Sadiq Khan uh, was, was unfair and inaccurate. I think public figures should seek to div unite rather than divide um, communities. Why was it wrong? That's that's what I'd well, do if I was kids. I'm not asking you. I did, well, why what? didn't he? I don't understand why he didn't repeat the answer which he repeated on Nick's show, which Probably speaks forgot. a little bit about yeah, why they think he said there he they conflated Islamism, a very form of a form of hateful extremism, with Muslims in general, which is Islamophobic. Which, sure, but why didn't why doesn't he not explain that? Yeah. Um, on on Sky News, I don't don't quite understand that. The way it, it, he said he was wrong in the way that he characterised Sadiq Khan. What Lee said about him wasn't true. It was divisive. We are better than that. Mm. If only they'd said that 24 hours ago. Well, they maybe Sunak will be able this. to bat it off then. Well, maybe Sunak will be. I'm not quite as optimistic as you about them being able to bat it off without. No. Well, well, let's find out, shall we? But equally, let's yes. go now. Uh, thank George, you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister in his uh, remarks about Lord Cormac and uh, Ronnie Campbell? A Tory MP spent last week claiming that Britain is run by a shadowy cabal made up of activists, the deep state and, most chillingly of all, the Financial Times. <laughs> uh, at what point did his party give up on governing and become the political wing of the Flat Earth Society? Yeah. Oh, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Another week where the Honourable Member is just sniping from the sidelines because he has absolutely nothing that he can say what we do. What we're getting on with, Mr Speaker, 
is delivering on the people's priorities. The number of small boats down by a third, Mr. Speaker. NHS performance improving, inflation continuing to fall. And, and Mr. Speaker, not only that, we're delivering a significant tax cut for millions of working Britons. While, while his incoherent energy plans would put taxes up for everyone across the country. Mr Speaker, his predecessor spent last week in America trying to flog her new book. In search of fame and wealth, she's taken to slagging off an under... Uh, they made her Prime Minister, now they can't bear talking about her. In search of fame and wealth, she's taken to slagging off and undermining Britain at every opportunity. She claimed... She claimed that as Prime Minister she was sabotaged by the deep state. She also remained silent as Tommy Robinson, that right-wing thug, was described as a hero. Why is he allowing her to stand as a Tory MP at the next election? Well, Mr Speaker, I don't believe a single member of this House supports Tommy Robinson, Mr Speaker. But, But, Mr Speaker... If, if he wants to talk about former leaders and predecessors, the whole, the whole country knows his record because he sat there while anti-Semitism ran rife in this party and not once but twice backed a man who called Hamas friends, Mr Speaker. But to their credit, to their credit, the Shadow Chancellor, the Shadow Home Secretary and indeed the Shadow Foreign Secretary refused to back the former Labour leader. But he didn't, because he's spineless, hopeless and utterly shameless. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, I've changed my party for the better. He is being changed by his party. The reason he's letting her stand is because he's too weak to do anything about it. It's the story of his leadership. When they refuse to accept any blame for the ruin of the last 14 years, you do wonder who they think has been running the country all this time. Thankfully, the former Prime Minister is on hand again to help. It turns out it's all the fault of the media, the corporate world and, bizarrely, the President of the United States. Winston Churchill once said, the price of greatness is responsibility. Now, I don't think the British public are expecting greatness from this Prime Minister, just a bit of accountability. So doesn't think it would be great if just for once the Tories actually took some responsibility. Mr Speaker, he talks about leadership, he talks about change, but when I learnt of something that I didn't agree with, I suspended one of my MPs straight away. But when he, but Mr Speaker, but Mr Speaker, when he learned, when he learned of vile anti-Semitic resu- remarks made by a Labour candidate, what did he do, Mr. Speaker? He instructed his team to defend him. He sent, he sent a shadow cabinet minister to campaign for him, and he personally backed him for days. And that's the difference between us. I act on my principles. He hasn't got any. I can't believe he's saying it with a straight face. The former Prime Minister continued on her American odyssey. This work, this journey into the wild west of her mind. She also claimed, she also claimed, Mr Speaker, that Nigel Farage is the man to restore the Tory party. Can the Prime Minister confirm whether he too would welcome Mr Farage back into the Tory fold? Mr Speaker, in our party, we have a proud tradition of diversity and accepting everyone from every background. Indeed, it is a proud record that puts Labour to shame, Mr Speaker. This is the party that delivered the first Jewish Prime Minister, the first female Prime Minister, the first Black Chancellor, the first Muslim Home Secretary, and now led by the first British Asian Prime Minister. While it seems he can only champion men from North London, it's the Conservatives that represent modern Britain. So, so this, this diverse Tory party does welcome Nigel Farage. The Prime Minister two months, two months, two months ago, the Prime Minister said that
the Tory party is a broad church. I welcome lots of people who want to subscribe to our ideals and our values. This is the same Nigel Farage who said he agreed with the basic premise of Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech and bemoaned the influence of the Jewish lobby. So is the Prime Minister simply too scared to stand up to the gaggle of Tory MPs who moonlight as GB presenters? Or does he genuinely think Nigel Farage shares the ideals and values of the Tory party? Mr Speaker, he wants to talk about values, but tomorrow in Rochdale, the people will have a choice of three former Labour candidates, two of which are anti-Semites, Mr Speaker. The truth is, his party is so mired in hate that despite three ex-Labour candidates standing, he can't back a single one of them. Speaker, it's because we expel anti Semites, he makes them Labour candidates. Mr. Speaker, the, the truth is, these are no longer the Tories your parents voted for, and the public can see it. The Prime Minister has lost control of his party to the hordes of records of malcontents. The tinfoil hat brigade over there, the extremists who wreck the economy, all lining up to undermine him, humiliate him, and eventually to get rid of him. When will he ever stand up to them and end the pathetic spectacle of a Tory party that used to try and beat Nigel Farage, now giving up and dancing to his tune instead? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker utterly shameless from someone who stood by while anti-Semitism ran rife in his party, oversaw the appalling situation in Rochdale and twice back the member for Islington North. And in the last few homes, Mr Speaker, last few weeks, we have seen members of Parliament's homes surrounded, their events disrupted, council meetings threatened and just last week we saw the very rules that govern this place abused because of intimidation, Mr Speaker. While he might, while he might, Mr. Speaker, while he might want to bend to mob rule, we will face down the extremists and stand up for British values. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, two years ago last Saturday, Russian forces launched their heinous attack on Ukraine. The response of the British government and the British people has been magnificent, and I want to pay my own tribute to all those who have done so much, not least in my own constituency of Bracknell, where Ukrainian people have been so warmly welcomed. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we must never bow to tyranny. So could the Prime Minister please assure the House that our support to Ukraine and all of our NATO allies will continue to be unwavering? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, can I join my honourable friend in thanking people up and down the country, including the people of Bracknell, for welcoming Ukrainian families into their homes and communities. During my visit to Ukraine in January, I announced a major new package of support, including two and a half billion pounds of military assistance. And last week, we announced 50 new sanctions targeting individuals and businesses sustaining Putin's illegal war machine. Our support to Ukraine will never waver. SNP leader Stephen Flynn. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, 30,000 people dead, 70,000 injured, 1.5 million sheltering in Rafa, 300,000 living in what is considered to be feral conditions in northern Gaza, and of course 100 hostages still tragically held by Hamas. It is the horror of those numbers that demands that this House have its say, just as it is the horror of those numbers that show that this House should demand an immediate ceasefire. Now, President Biden has indicated that that ceasefire may take place from Monday. Does the Prime Minister share in his confidence? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, we have consistently called for an immediate humanitarian pause which would allow for the safe release of hostages, including British nationals and more aid, to reach Gaza. We welcome progress on a deal. As the Honourable Gentleman said, there has been progress and we urge 
everyone on all sides to seize the opportunity. And I've been clear that we must seize the momentum from this terrible tragedy to find a lasting resolution to this conflict, which delivers on the promise of a two-state solution and ensures that Israelis and Palestinians can live in dignity and security. Stephen Flynn. Mr Speaker, we're now approaching five months since this conflict first began. And in that time, this House has equivocated and this government on three occasions at the United Nations has abstained when it could have voted for a ceasefire. Abstentionism is not leadership. So can I ask the Prime Minister, should this matter now come before the United Nations with a ceasefire potentially in sight, will he use his government's vote in order to deliver that ceasefire. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, we support the United States draft resolution uh, that was discussed with colleagues at United Nations last week, but just calling for an immediate full ceasefire now, which collapses back into fighting within days or weeks, and indeed does not release hostages, including British hostages, is not in anyone's interest. We must work towards a permanent ceasefire, and that starts with an immediate humanitarian pause to get aid in and hostages out. I agree with the Honourable Gentleman about the suffering of the people in Gaza, and in this country we should be proud of everything we are doing to help them and provide them the life-saving aid that they deserve. Dr Jamie Wallace. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm sure we're all proud of the open government we have, the availability of information and our open 13 data. 13 minutes but after 12 is the fast. time. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. So some, a couple of really quite glaring problems there for Rishi Sunak, and yet the tone, perhaps, of PMQs um, uh, suggests certainly that his own benches rather enjoy the resurrection of the ghost of Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Natasha Clark is with me. I think should we should take a break and then come back and pick over the bones uh, immediately afterwards. I, I just one thing I would just reflect upon briefly is that Rishi Sunak said specifically then that he had got rid of 30p Lee without naming him of course uh, at the moment he found out about what 30p Lee had said there's there's a problem here and, and I'll quote what he just said uh, when I learned of something I didn't agree with I suspended one of my MPs straight away on Saturday, the official line from Downing Street was, and I quote again, following his refusal to apologise, the chief whip has suspended the conservative whip from Lee Anderson MP. So they were either telling untruths on Saturday or telling untruths in the House of Commons chamber just a few minutes ago. More on this. Sorry, more on that after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 17 minutes after 12, he went in on um, some of that stuff, but he didn't go in on the stuff that we perhaps expected him to. And I wonder, Natasha Clark, if that is actually because by not going in directly on the stuff that we expected him to, going for the Liz Truss entrance rather than the uh, Lee Anderson entrance, he would have not gone in on the stuff that Rishi Sunak was expecting Maybe. him to as well. Yeah, but also it is all linked, right? It's this argument that Keir Starmer is now making... You're, you're, this is no longer the Tory party your parents voted for. It's a for. good line, that. That works, doesn't mm. it? Um, they're saying that the path, you know, and that taps into that what we've been hearing all week about about the Islamophobia row within the Conservative Party. Um, and yes, it did descend into a bit of which former leader was worse, Liz Truss or Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. Um, you know, but that was a very but, weird thing for Sunak to do because Starmer got rid of Jeremy Corbyn. So you say, well, have, are you going to get rid of Liz Truss? And then Rishi Sunak said, presumably because he wasn't expecting that question, yeah. Rishi Sunak responds, I said, well, what about Jeremy Corbyn? Everyone knows that he has got rid of Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, exactly. So, so the argument is weaker because he's already kicked him out of the party. Yes. Liz Truss is thus still a member of the Conservative Party and um, quite wacky right-wing American conferences. Yeah, wacky is kind, but I take it. It is kind. Um, I, yeah, I quite I really enjoyed the, um, the Keir Starmer's language today i think it was it was good um the flat earth society was my was a, was a favorite quote of mine that was good mm. um but yeah no he's you know oh yeah a journey into the wild wildest wild west of her mind that was a good one I, I, again I, on liz trust on the other hand some good new lines he has trotting out and he's alienated very deliberately with the stuff about farage he's alienated some of the voters that some people felt, much myself included, he was trying too hard to keep sweet. He was yes. trying too hard to... There was a big shift there. And I wonder whether, in fact, getting those big guns out, finally, 
people might have expected them to have a little bit more effect because it was not a rollover that for Starmer by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. Sun- Sunak's voice is a very fractious chamber. The speaker quiet for reasons about yeah, which we can only speculate. Clearly but the, feeling but, slightly weaker after you know, his, uh, Resurrecting the ghost of Jeremy week. Corbyn plays very well with the Tory party. I don't know how well it's going to play outside the Commons anymore because he's not he's not a factor. He's not a Labour MP. But, but the... I, I, I guess the the two sidesing of the this is what Raphael Baer writes about in the Guardian today. Every time Keir Starmer cites the Islamophobia of Tory MPs or the absolute crackerjackery of of Liz Truss and some others, or bringing in Robinson, Little Tommy, Ten Names, and Farage, um, then all that Sunak needs to do to keep his troops happy is shout anti-Semitism at the top yeah, of his and, voice. And it's not, and like you mentioned earlier on the show, I think it was that we we, we can't fall into this trap of just thinking that Labour and anti- mm. is an anti-Semitism problem. Islamophobia is a Tory yeah. problem, but that's exactly how both party leaders today painted it as, yes, well, we've got a problem true. with this, but you've got a problem with that. Um, and yes, it doesn't quite resonate, the, the Jeremy Corbyn argument, I think, as much as as much as Rishi Shinak likes to think it was, but he's not got a lot else to reach for. Um, the problem with the Conservative Party is that they say that they want to be a broad church party and to reach all of these different sides of society. But, you know, if that's the argument that Rishi Sunak wants to make... Um, you know, Keir Starmer can say, well, actually, I've got a, I've got a united party. My party is a ready for government party. I'm not the one that's falling out with people. We're not having a discussion about how, whether we should let Nigel Farage back in the party. We're not trying to, you know, be pulled in all these different directions. Um, very much like the Labour Party was pulled to the left. Now the Conservative Party is arguably being pulled to the right yeah, by theirs. I, and, and is Sunak going to look like a... A Corbyn or a Starmer? Or is he going to be someone to fix this problem or someone to um, cause it? Mm. The, the the bit I don't quite get is who he's frightened of because he's put himself, and I think Starmer failed to capitalise on these points. But 30p Lee has been... I saw a, t- a tweet yesterday that revealed the motorway junction and <laughs> service station at which... 30p Lee had met with the the fellow that's not Farage from the Reform Party, and I mean it was it was like Alan Partridge had never left us. The 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 mad sort of anarchy sadness of it, notwithstanding, if if this party, this so called party, um, is a place in which Lee Anderson would be made welcome, how can the chairman of it be someone? Who could be made welcome in the Conservative Party? Uh, there's mm. so many. So, who, what, why would Sunak not say? Of course, there's no place. He's, he's happy to do it with uh, effectively Nigel Farage in a bomber jacket, little mm. Tommy Ten names, but he won't stand up in the House of Commons and say, "No, we've got no room for this bloke who talks about the Jewish lobby and fifth columnists and mm. uh, regularly deploys precisely the sort of rhetoric that 30p Lee was aping mm-hmm. at the weekend." Why won't he mm. say that? Because that would cause much more problems for him than getting rid of 30p Lee. I think that sort of goes to the heart of the point why the Prime Minister has not wanted to say the word Islamophobia and why they haven't wanted to talk about anti-Muslim hatred because I think it it will open a Pandora's box of what many of their, arguably many of their voters... Mm have strong feelings yeah, so on. Yeah, forget about the MPs, it's the voters. I think that's it, yeah, and that's exactly why he didn't want to attack Nigel Farage. Which is why Starmer may have been a little cleverer than I've given him credit for, because he's pushing Sunak ever closer to having to make that choice explicitly. We're going to have to keep the voters who like 30p Lee sweet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Even though we've suspended 30p Lee, but if you keep pushing me on people like Truss and people like Farage, Braverman, mm-hmm. I thought was going. Mm-hmm. I actually thought he's going to bring Braverman mm. out at question three or four, mm. and he didn't. Went straight in he with went, that. He just went. Yeah, it went. Oh no, he went straight in with Truss and then kept Braverman in reserve. But that's the problem Sunak's got. Is he knows what his base is. He knows what his support is built on. Yeah. And he can never really admit it publicly. Yeah, and like I say, arguably he, he like I say, has had a strong argument that he has changed the. Labour Party and he has kicked people like Jeremy Corbyn out whether you will argue that he was slow or, or not to do that to the to the candidates in Rochdale which I think was you know unfortunate and that yeah, is but, that but is again he's there are they're all former Labour members so so the idea that Starmer is weak mm. is proved by the fact that none of them are actually campaigning on a Labour ticket mm. anymore one of the people he's referring to is George bloody Galloway I don't mm. think that Keir Starmer was even in Parliament oh, was he was when he talking about Simon Dancic the former Labour oh, yeah possibly that's, but again that's how I read nothing it. to do but with the Starmer era well he said three though Ah, so three. Okay, yeah, Galloway. Yeah, yeah Danchuk and Danzig. Yeah, and but Danchuk is from Farage's party, I think, and there's no room for Farage in the Tory party. So yeah. Sunak's tying himself in all sorts of knots. Yeah, and you can, but you can see, you can see the nervousness from the Conservative Party when reform are getting ten, twelve, fifteen percent in 
in elections. Like they are not going to be taking chunks. We think, according to some of the polling, I think that's come out since those by-elections, it doesn't appear that those chunks of voters are coming out of Labour voters. It appears they're coming out of Conservative voters and, mm. and people on who don't believe that Rishi Sunak is right-wing enough and that want to see more of this action. And that's where the nervousness within the Conservative Party about our unwillingness to criticise Nigel Farage, at least he did decide mm. to come out and criticise Tommy Robinson, at least that's a that's one thing, um, at least. But but yes, I think that's why there is a nervousness around opening up this Pandora's box about about what these issues represent to some of their core voters and trying desperately not to alienate some of them in the run-up to an election and trying to bring all of those parts of those parties. You know, Keir Starmer should should realise he's not getting any of those voters, obviously. He's not getting any of those Nigel Farage voters. I no. think they were, they're really, obviously, you know, post-Brexit, there was an argument, right, of a lot of Labour voters voted for Brexit. We yeah. don't want to criticise people like Nigel Farage and Liz Truss because yeah. it was a Brexit thing. I think we've now moved on from that argument and he now feels that it is safe and it is... But that was the that most point. significant thing that happened today, I think, was that, that he actually did almost say, there are some votes I do not want. Yes, uh, and, and whether it's them. a strength or a weakness, up until this point, Keir Starmer hasn't really given much impression of whose votes he doesn't want. No, and he's you know he's held back a lot, mm, Sir Keir Starmer. His, his language is never, I don't, I don't remember it being such a punchy one um, in terms of his actual language and, you know, calling it a pathetic spectacle, mm. you know, the tinfoil hat brigade. He wants to undermine and humiliate him. Um, some really strong language um, coming out and I think the Prime Minister was on the back foot and he didn't expect the argument to be framed from Keir Starmer in, in quite like this way. Um, so, yeah, he, he has arguably stood up to those people who say that he should be pandering to to the Brexit vote, pandering to the Nigel Farage's of the world because, you know, some of them might vote for you and said, now, actually, you know what, I'm doing well enough in the polls. I don't need those votes. Um, yeah, it's, uh, so I, I suppose it all leads us to the question of, just how nasty it's going to get. As far as I'm aware, and people will correct me if not you, will correct me when I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, Starmer doesn't, he, he, he tends to criticise behaviour rather than individual. So he, he doesn't call Rishi Sunak names yet. I think he came closest today to doing that. Sunak doesn't have similar reservations. He's happy no. to accuse Keir Starmer of all sorts of personal... He doesn't have any principles. Yeah, there we yeah, go. Et cetera, et cetera. So all, 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 all that kind of thing. Um, and we're still months out from any general election it, mm. this is going to be horrible it's going it? to be a horrible election I, I firmly believe that it's going to be horrible from both sides I think Labour are really willing to roll up their sleeves and get nasty too I think that, that it's going to really descend into complete mudslinging from both sides and I, I don't think anybody's going to be holding back but can I mean, I mean Labour could just campaign on 14 years of Tory government they but, could but, yeah. but I'm if, sure they will but if the other lot start throwing... I mean, what do you do if the other lot have nothing but, as 30p Lee told us, transgender toilets and culture wars? If you've got nothing other than that, how do you respond to these personal attacks, if not by going on the attack yourself? Mm. And, you know, remember those some of those very punchy Labour attack adverts that came out, was it about a year ago now, yes. where, you know, Rishi Sunak is um, someone that lets criminals off the hook and lets rapists and paedophiles roam our streets? Wow. That that was that was a step forward, and I, th yeah. I think I think I can see Labour going, you know, are uh, strong if Ugh. not stronger on that sort of argument, whether what? rightly or wrongly. I don't think they need to. I think you're right. You know, they're doing so well yes. already. I don't see why they need to descend themselves to that. You've got to pu you've got to push back. It's a difference between self defence and offence, isn't it? So you've got to push back mm. at some point, and one way of pushing back is by undermining the credibility of the person who's attacking you. But it's yeah. and that's what the, you know. The Tory argument is: the kid of Sam doesn't stand for anything. He's mm. spineless. What does he believe? What does he think? And then he comes out and says yeah. all of this stuff. Yeah, exactly. Then everyone goes, "Oh, that's a bit much. That's yes. a bit much." Yes, exactly. It's about anyway. I think the most significant development today was Starmer finding uh, the space into which he's not prepared to move or, or, or identifying the voters who he's not got any interest in wooing. And they are essentially mm. Nigel Farage fans. Yeah. That's the crucial point here. He's essentially said, look, forget your red wall, forget your 30p Lee, forget all of your rhetoric about getting Brexit done and oven ready deals. If you're a Farage fan, if you're still swallowing that snake oil, I'm not the politician mm. for you. And that, that could prove crucial. Mm. And I think if he can make this argument like I say, it's no longer the Tory party you voted for. The, the Tory party has changed for the worse. The Labour party has changed for the better. That's a nice message that he can get uh, get across, I think. Final question. Will Sadiq Khan feel a bit let down that 
the leader of the Labour Party didn't come into bat for him with regard to 30p Lee? I don't think so. I don't think he needs that. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll ask him tomorrow when he joins me in the studio from 10 o'clock. And joining me in the studio after the news headlines is uh, Peter Gagan from the, the, the Democracy Now. Well, he'll be on the phone, don't worry. Don't stop splitting hairs, honestly. It's fine. No one's going to know if I say he's in the studio, are they? It's the quality of phone lines these days. Uh, he's got another cracking tale about the undue influence that so-called think tanks continue to exercise over our law makers. It is half past 12 and Amelia Cox is here with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.34 is the time. I, we should probably make a list, shouldn't we? I, we talked a lot in the first hour about the essential nature of freedom of expression and more pertinently, perhaps, given James Cleverley's comments about pro-Palestinian marches, freedom of assembly being essential bedrocks of, of our democracy. In terms of the protections that the public have against power, against untrammeled power or unfettered power, um, uh, the trade unions or the trade union movement would be very, very near the top of that list, which is perhaps why certain uh, representatives of power or cheerleaders for power have historically had such a huge... Power and wealth, of course, uh, have historically had such a huge problem with the trade union movement. Uh, Peter Gagan is one of this programme's favourite journalists, um, currently plying his trade at the Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, but also um, a, a rather splendid sub-stacker at Democracy for Sale, democracyforsale.substack.com. And um, although I think it's fair to say that the perspective is building momentum and becoming ever more popular, there were moments over the last few years where it felt like Peter, myself, and maybe two or three other people were the only ones who were seriously worried about the exceptional and extraordinarily amounts of influence being exerted over the media and latterly the Conservative Party by opaquely funded organisations based around a very small part of London near a street called Tufton, um, uh, uh, d d despite nobody really knowing who, who paid their bills. And it is to, in some ways, the mothership of that network, Peter, that you turn our attention today. Yeah, thanks very much, James. Yeah, as I've just published uh, recently, just in the last kind of 20 minutes on my Substack, a story about as you say, about unions and a, and a very, very important part of, of the Tupton Street uh, galaxy, an organisation called the Taxpayers' Alliance. And Taxpayers' Alliance sounds like, you know, it sounds like an alliance full of taxpayers, but <laughs> we actually don't know who it's an alliance for because they don't declare who funds them. So we don't know where the money for the Taxpayers' Alliance comes from. And what have they been up to? Or, or, or rather, and what is the government doing that seems to lead back to Tufton Street? Well, so interestingly, earlier this year, we brought in new legislation, which sounds quite arcane, but I think called the checkoff. It's basically to do with unions and union dues. If you work in the public sector, often your union dues are subtracted from your wages before you before they even hit your bank account. It's called a checkoff. There's long been a lot of opposition to this by the kind of people you've talked about at the, at the start of your show, at the start of this segment, James. A lot of people in government, a lot of people in the Conservative Party, and a lot of people in Tufton Street, and particularly Taxpayer Alliance, have long had a bee in their bonnet about this. So we brought in new legislation that says actually you have to pay for this. So public bodies will now have to recruit money from unions if you want to do this check off. Sounds complicated, but essentially what it means is it'll be harder for unions to get money from their from uh, from union members, and also makes it less likely to uh, to to for people to join unions. So you might ask, where does this legislation come from? Mm. That was a question I asked. It was like it's quite interesting. It's come in. It's been quite a bit of opposition to it from MPs and the Lords. And lo and behold, I got the documents for the impact assessment. And they're quite remarkable in that pretty much the only piece of analysis that's cited for this is a report from 2014 by the Taxpayers Alliance, who surprise, surprise, say this is, a this is, this is something that we should have got rid of and we should bring in the legislation that's now come to pass. I, you know, oddly, I, and just on a similar theme, I saw Kemi Badenoch citing some research from Civitas the other day to, to prove a point she was making about Islamophobia. And Civitas is, of course, an offshoot of the Institute for Economic Affairs, which is just around the corner from 55 Tufton Street, although I think Civitas might, might actually be on it. And, and another example, which I'm sure you spotted, of the government now using these opaquely funded organisations as if they were authorities on the areas... Uh, upon which they are paid by their mysterious donors to to pronounce. Why should my listeners be worried about this, Peter? Well, I think fundamentally, if you look at this legislation I've been writing about today, the government itself admits that the figures are out of date. It says they're not accurate. 
It says it's only going to save about 1.5 million across 28,000 public bodies. So there's a question like, why would you, why is that the thing you're going to do at a certain time when we've got a lot of issues in the public sector, is this thing you're going to want to do? But more generally, I think it does speak to this, uh, this way in which people where we don't know where their money comes from. Every so often we see some, we see a lot of, co- you know, most of the money we ever see goes into Tufton Street, comes from corporate donors. So there's a big issue if you've got corporate power is able to fund what are fakely funded lobby groups who are then able to influence government policy. It's quite, it's not that hard to see where the, where the problems might be because we fundamentally don't know who's paying for this. Um, I, I mean, they almost acknowledge the paucity of, of evidence underpinning the policy, don't they? The, 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 the quote, in the absence of more up-to-date, robust data, this impact assessment uses research conducted by the Taxpayers Alliance. Now, you spend a lot more time studying this stuff than I do. Is, is, is there a civil servant there sending us a secret message when they use the phrase, in the absence of more up-to-date, robust data? It's hard to see how that couldn't have been written by someone who was sort of saying, poof, it's it's that's one of the most remarkable. It is one of that's the most an incredible line. Yeah. It's quite remarkable. I think it really is. If there is an up to date data, so you go well. Why would you not go and find it? And instead of going to find it, there's a there's at one stage it says we also cite anecdotal data. And again, you're asking well, why would you not go and do this data rather than relying on the Taxpayers Alliance a report from ten years ago. One of the, as you write, most influential anonymously funded groups in British politics, although their membership is not anonymous. Um, It's headed, or it was certainly founded by a man who was ushered into the very heart of government by Liz Truss and subsequently put in the House of Lords by her. Yeah, so the founder of of the Taxpayers Alliance is is Matthew Elliott, who listeners might know actually from the Vote Leave campaign, uh, and then subsequently is now now a member of the House of Lords. Liz Truss also brought many other acolytes from from the Taxpayers Alliance and Tufton Street around her. Uh, Matthew Sinclair, who was the head of the Taxpayers Alliance before, uh, he subsequently became Liz Truss's economic advisor. And in fairness, the Taxpayers Alliance talked to them today. They said, you know, this, this is we're glad to see the government uh, following our policies and we'd like to see them do more of stuff. Which, so if, if this is the way, you, it, it probably isn't surprising. As if we've learned nothing from the uh, consequences of Liz Truss essentially introducing economic policies that were part of a fever dream from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, just another word, if you would, Peter, on on what this does to trade unions, because I know that um, uh, I, I know that Paul Novak, the uh, head of the TUC, the General Secretary of the TUC, has shared his thoughts with you on it. But in in layman's terms, those of us who understand that trade unions often offer up the only line of defence against overbearing or exploitative employers, how how does this dilute their power? How does this policy? presumably deliberately, dilute their strength? Well, so this is part of the bigger trade union act that actually came back in 2016. It was really celebrated by the Taxpayers Alliance and Tufton Street and really came from them. We had a big had a big push against unions, really. And this in, in itself is kind of, it, it makes it more difficult, essentially, for, for trade unions to raise money. They're Probably what they'll have to do is go and find new alternative ways to try and get their people. In the same way that you or I, if we had direct debits and we were just forced to sit down and look at every one of them and actually go off and action each of them, yeah. we might start cancelling some of them. So in the short term, it might mean a squeeze for trade unions and in the longer term it's just it's more obstacles when it comes to people trying to join trade unions which frankly has been of a piece with this government especially over the last uh, eight, eight or so years so an organization that is opaquely funded has succeeded in influencing a government policy designed to make it harder for a transparently funded organization that explicitly and expressly represents workers or if you prefer taxpayers income taxpayers interests they've made it harder for them to raise money the the, the opaquely funded the the, the opaquely funded outfit has given a policy to the government that makes it harder for the transparently funded outfit to raise money to work on workers or taxpayers behalf and the opaquely funded outfit calls itself the taxpayers alliance yeah, effectively, that's what's happened. And government will say that they're they're using this money for taxpayers. But if you can, as you can see, when you look at the analysis, it's quite small, bare 1.5 million across, as I say, 28,000 public bodies. Again, in the climate that we're in, and that's mm. the be- that's the most probable analysis. The lower analysis from the report is even lower. I, I guess even if the imp- importance of the detail eludes you, the the idea that a government now, even even with its slightly reduced ma- majority since Boris Johnson's election victory, can essentially railroad th- through legislation as you describe it, without having to provide any an- analysis, meaningful, up to date, robust analysis proving that it actually works. I and mean, this is, it's hard to think of a more egregious example of 
uh, ideology very much in quotes, uh, wealth fetishizing also very much in quotes, somehow trumping traditional policy making processes. I think that's the broader so- issue with yeah. this as well, is how influence works in this country. We've seen it. We saw it with Liz Truss. We've seen it up in times in recent years with pieces of policy where you go, well, where does this come from? We see it with the amount of media space that are given over to people from uh, opaquely funded organisations. Again, most of them uh, satellited around this small bit of Tufton Street. I remember when I was doing some research not too long ago, writing my last book, I spoke to a former government minister who told me if he did a quarter million pounds burning a hole in his pocket and he wanted to influence policy, he wouldn't give it to a political party, he'd give it to a think tank because that's the easiest way to get these ideas out there and they sound neutral and they sound like they're coming mm. from somewhere else but if we don't know who's actually paying for them unlike say a trade union well then you know it's surely surely that's the act of transparency we should have at the very least i notice actually this is probably a conversation we'll have on another occasion i've noticed a couple of these characters who, who we've been keeping an eye on for a few years are now moving into quotes polling end quotes as opposed to policy influencing they're, they're getting their polling published in prominent newspapers and it is of course polling that incredibly coincidentally seems to serve the interests of precisely the uh, in- individuals or institutions that we believe secretly fund the think tanks that these people used to work for. Well it's fascinating to see how polling, polling has a huge influence in policy, we can see it, we saw it with that MRP poll that the only person attached to us was David Frost that suggested that Tories uh, Although it wasn't him that paid together. for it, it was, he it was just the person journalists were referred to to talk about it without anybody knowing who actually signed the cheque for that and it ended up on, on the absolute front page, the splash of the Daily Telegraph. And led the news agenda frankly for it weeks did, afterwards. Yes. We have seen it actually. Aaron Banks, the Brexit donor, paid for polling recently in Clacton, which suggested Nigel Farage was going to win. Polling is a very, very, very effective way of influencing political conversations in ways you want to do it. And frankly, without having to declare a hell of a lot. There's not a huge amount of transparency on polling. There's not a lot of transparency about who's funding polling. The David Frost uh, example you cite is a really good example. No one thinks David Frost spent £70,000 on it, but no one's telling us who it is. Peter, I always enjoy talking to you, not least because it reassures me that I'm not going mad, or at least if I am, then I'm not alone. But um, these are a very, very important issues that finally seem to be achieving some of the salience that they have deserved for years. You can follow Peter's work on Substack at democracyforsale.substack.com. Um, and that is, you know, if you're a worker or indeed a proper taxpayer, then the organisations, the transparently funded organisations that exist to protect your interests are trade unions, not Tufton Street, quotes, think tanks, end quotes. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Ten minutes to one, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I think we might return to that territory, that very interesting territory, Um, of young people getting most of their news from social media, even though they think it is far less trustworthy than television or newspapers. And I'm increasingly drawn to the idea that this is probably good news rather than bad news, given with, for me, and with the acknowledgement of forms of bias making their way into any organisation, because even by dint of the subjects I choose to talk about, even if I didn't offer up an opinion on them, which of course I usually do, but simply by choosing. I mean, even a newsreader is biased. When they decide what stories to put in the news, they are excluding other stories. Natasha and I just uh, elected, or I elected, or I forgot to ask her about Stephen Flynn's intervention at PMQs. Some people will perceive there an anti-Scottish bias or an anti-SNP bias. And although they'd be wrong to think that it was a a motivating factor, they'd be right to say that it was an unfair omission from the SNP's point of view. So you have bias everywhere. Why should I be worried that young people are getting most of their news from social media when it's the old people I know who are the problem? George is in York. George, what would you like to say? Hi, yeah, so um, I found, um, especially kind of in the past two years or so, um, my parents have generally become a lot more, <clears throat> they tend to get a lot more of their news from social media, um, similar to me. Yes. Um, and I found that they don't seem to understand the algorithms and how they actually work yeah. and why you this get... Is it. So this is this is the call we needed, George. This is the point I've been nibbling at the edges of without properly articulating you you know how it works yeah so i because you've grown up with it yeah exactly i was at school i was always taught about referencing and then at university i was always talked about taught about referencing and that i generally don't take anything on face value anymore 
Um, whereas my parents, they would seem to typically watch something and then I think they almost view everything in the same way as the BBC. Well, it looks a bit like the BBC, like so it must, be, it must have gone through the same processes of fact-checking that the BBC goes through because it looks, it looks the same. <laughs> Yeah, it's why exactly. it's why parties put things through letterboxes during election campaigns that look like local newspapers, isn't it? Yes, exactly. We've had quite a few of them, and it's Have you? they they seem to be tending to take the, they're almost they're catching on to them. that's a good way of doing it. It seemed to have been the Lib Dems that started it, and then it seems to have developed from there. Um, but no, I just generally find that um, they just they just don't seem to understand the algorithms, which is not their fault because they're not taught how it works. Whereas I'm, we always talk at work, say, if I watch something really weird or funny, they'll be like, oh, there's my algorithm gone. It'll mess up, like, what you'll start seeing things related to that. And I mm. kind of understand that, whereas they just don't seem to recognise that what you view is what you're going to get shown. So are your mum and dad swallowing anything dangerous? Not necessarily. No. It's more they're kind of... They tend to become concerned about things that don't actually affect them so for example right. um, yes. like the trans issues and things like that they my family have never interacted with the trans person <laughs> but they actually they have negative views on them because of what they're fed via the media but they when actually i don't think they necessarily have a problem with them it's more what they're actually fed and because they read it they believe it and then they reinforce it and read more and, and end up thinking that it's a really big deal that, that somehow does affect them even as it doesn't exactly which They're is why about. rishi sunak brings it up in pmqs because he's appealing to people who've been groomed is the word i'd use by social media in this case although you'll get a lot of the similar positions in traditional media your parents don't stop to wonder why that is infiltrating their lives in the way no, that it they is don't question why they're actually the reason why it's there because ultimately it's never affected them it never likely never will affect them in terms of their actual everyday life but they almost get whipped into a frenzy and kind of a fear and then that just the more that they fear something oh, yeah. the they so all you're describing it. to me is social media doing what the daily mail has done for years actually and it's yeah. the young people under your analysis and we all suffer a bit from confirmation bias yeah but under your analysis your 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 age group how old are you george uh, 20, 24 tw 24 your age group is probably better equipped to recognize the extremities or to recognize the dangers um and therefore the importance of like earlier callers have said, taking a multiplicity of positions to find out where the truth lies, which is almost certainly somewhere between the two extremes, than your parents' generation is. So we should be more worried yeah. about them than you. Yeah, exactly. And I find especially, I, for example, people, I tend to spend, probably spend more time on social media than my parents. Right. Which I think also means that if something changes, say my parents saw a news article one day, that may just completely leave their newsfeed and they might not see it again. Yeah. So they've had that confirmed to That's them. Their, but if I'm they're not the seeing the response, or, they're not seeing the rejection, the rebuttal, they're not seeing the, the, the fact check, they're not seeing the evolution. I, well, I, listen, I hope you're not confirming my biases, but I am increasingly of the view that this is not anything like the problem that some people are seeking to portray it as. Um, engagement with current affairs is perhaps an issue, but the idea that it's bad news that people are using social media more than newspapers and latterly television when at least two television stations exist solely to, uh, to, to peddle influence of plutocrats who want to have even more influence over the Tory party. It does. I don't know quite what it is I'm supposed to be scared about. Michael's in Brighton. Last word to you, I think, on this, Michael. What would you like to say? Well, hi, James. So I'd like to say that I think the reason why young people are more gravitated to social media is because of the power of instant engagement. And, you know, unlike legacy news, um, it's just one way. And there's no way that you can even challenge the story. Well, hang on. Um, you're on. You're live on legacy news media <laughs> right now, challenging the story. Just to... <laughs> no, but more I'm talking about a newspaper. Yes, I know you newspaper are. I, I, yeah. I'm just doing a little bit of low-level marketing, Michael. Give me a break. <laughs> but the one thing that really struck a chord with me was um, when I saw this guy who actually mentioned you in... Uh, in name and what he said really confused me because he was arguing against critical thinking and he was saying that there's a a group who listen to James O'Brien and 
what you do is you form an argument in a way that he calls is artificial, but it enables you to deploy sequential reasoning to arrive at a conclusion that is inescapable, which is pretty much what you want to do when you're challenging or debating someone. You know, you want to get them into a position where you say, okay, why do you think what you're thinking? And his argument for that is that, well, that's not good for the average person. I like think, I, think I follow you. I'm not going to ask you who it was because it sounds like a desperate attempt to, to, to coattail my epic popularity in pursuit of a few points for some yeah, no mark. Yeah. So I will resist the urge to, to, to find out who it is that you're talking about. But that would involve somebody trying to poo-poo the mode of media that we practice here at El- or that I practice here on this programme. In favour of what, Michael? What would be the thing that this person would prescribe in, in, in preference to me, for example? So I think, well, he's not actively saying that, but what I think he's trying to go for is for the simple solution to complex problems. Because when I first saw this person's clips on on TikTok and social media, I found found him quite engaging and captivating. And then I just saw one of his clips where he was talking about something and I didn't really agree with it. And then I went back to look at the rest of his clips and I realized that actually he's just really good at marketing and that's all he cares about is sort of, and, that, and that is why you would end, that is why you would end up seeking to um, deploy someone. And I'm not being cocky now. I'm just describing. It's not an opinion. It's counting someone considerably more popular than you are to uh, um, try and draw some attention to yourself. It, look, it happens absolutely everywhere. It's not by any means unique to social media, but it is um, a perfectly natural. It's be like Kid and Mister Harry is challenging. Uh, and I support Kidder Mr. Harriers. Imagine if Kidder Mr. Harriers were to challenge Liverpool to a football game and Liverpool said, well, you know, if you if you win through six rounds of the FA Cup, we, we can play we can play in the fifth round, but we're not we're not coming to Agborough for a game of football with Kidderminster Harriers just because you've challenged us to a game of football. Um, but, hey, if you need to explain it, then uh, the, the, the point isn't clear enough. Just a quick reminder that the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, will be taking your calls on this programme from 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. You can put your question to him ahead of time, so get in there early by heading to lbc.co.uk forward slash question. Um, that's tomorrow morning from 10. I wonder if he will be able to articulate precisely what it is that Lee Anderson lost the whip for, apart from doing something, quotes, wrong, end quotes, because I haven't found a Tory yet who's capable of doing so, except Saeed Avasi, who isn't really in the mainstream Tory party anymore, despite having been deputy chairman, and she'll be joining me tomorrow to record a full disclosure. Coming up at four uh, on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now standing in for Sheila Fogarty, it's Sangeeta Maiska. James O'Brien on LBC. 